Muslims, amongst the black people in America, and also um, the human uh, society in general. Assalamu alaikum uh, to everybody. Welcome to Viva the Strangers uh, Clubhouse. We are gathered here this evening to remember Dr. Betty Shabazz. We're just waiting for a couple more of our speakers to arrive. Our Kari is also here, and we're going to be started in exactly two minutes, inshallah. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Okay, Bismillah rahman rahim I think we'll get started now. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Remembering Dr. Betty Shabazz tribute here on Clubhouse. Um, I thank each and every one of you for joining us uh, today. Like I said earlier, this Wednesday was the 24th anniversary of uh, Dr. Betty's return to Allah. We gathered here uh, this evening to remember this remarkable woman who was a symbol of courage, strength and resilience. And also, for many people, um, regarded Dr. Betty Shabazz as, you know, being the wife of Malcolm X. She was that and much more. And this is why we are gathered here this evening um, to remember her with some amazing speakers. Um, the event is being hosted by Viva the Strangers. Uh, Viva the Strangers is an online platform dedicated to embracing and celebrating our strangeness as Islam. And the entire um, page is inspired by the hadith, Islam began a strange and will return a strange glad tidings to the strangers. And it's all about who are these strangers? What do they believe in? And I think, you know, being Muslim today and the way we navigate the world and its constant changes, we are ever the, uh, the strangers. I'm also pleased um, to say that um, the uh, tonight's um, event is also um, brought to you by Rumi's Cave, um, which of which my brother Rakeem Niaz uh, is a host. Uh, Rakeem, if you'd like to tell everybody a bit about Rumi's Cave, and then we'll introduce our speakers and get, to get started on the program. Rakeem, over to you. Assalamu alaikum, rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhu. Alhamdulillah, um, uh, salam alaikum to all of our I think we might have lost you there. This is the um, clubhouse, mashallah. Uh, Rakeen has just had a phone call come through. Uh, while we wait for Rakeen uh, to come back, I'm just going to introduce uh, some of our speakers. I've got Abdullah Molin he Molim here on stage, who is a podcaster and freelance journalist who will also be co-presenting with myself and Rakeen. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Imam Zaid Shakir, who's also with us this evening. We've got Khalil Ismail, a uh, Nasheed artist, and we've got my sister, uh, Taslim Jamil, um, who will also be performing tonight. And brother, whilst we're waiting for um, brother Rakeen to come back, um, before we uh, begin this evening. Every good gathering should have a good opening, and what what better opening than the word of Allah? It's my pleasure to introduce uh, a friend and um, a family friend, uh, brother Sultan uh, Ahmed, who will start the tribute off for us. Uh, Sultan is the director of Nikah Co, the UK's leading award-winning uh, nikah service. Uh, Sultan is an avid reciter of the Quran and has won numerous Quran recitations 
uh, competitions in the Middle East and the UK. During Ramadan uh, in 2018, Sultan made history by opening the first ever iftar at the House of Commons here in London with a recitation from the Holy Quran. The event was hosted by the speakers of the House of Commons and outside of his professional commitments, Sultan is an avid uh, beekeeper. Sultan, this is also his first time on Clubhouse, so please do make him feel welcome by following him. Uh, Sultan, I now hand over to you uh, to begin tonight uh, with Quran recitation. Jazakumullah khair, sister Ashraf. Um, alhamdulillah, uh, it's an absolute honor uh, to be here in front of you all uh, with all the distinguished guests and all the listeners. So, assalamu alaikum to uh, every single one of you. I'm going to begin with a short recitation uh, from Surah Al Ahzab, and that's ayah number 35, which is quite a profound uh, verse mm -hmm. in the Holy Quran, and I'll explain uh, the meaning of that as well, inshallah ta'ala. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات والقانتين والقانتات والصادقين والصادقات والصادقين والصادقات والصابرين والصابرات والخاشعين والخاشعات والخاشعين والخاشعات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Surely, Muslim men and Muslim women, believing men and believing women, devout men and devout women, truthful men and truthful women. Patient men and patient women, humble men and humble women, and the men who give charity, sadaqah, and the women who give charity, sadaqah, and the men who fast and the women who fast, and the men who guard their private paths against evil acts, and the women who guard theirs, and the men who remember Allah much, and the women who remember Allah for them, Allah has prepared forgiveness and a great reward. Now, in uh, just to elaborate a little bit more, Mu'adh bin Anas Juhani uh, relates that a person asked the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Who among those who strive in the way of Allah will get the highest reward?" Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam replied, "The one who remembers Allah the most." The man asked, "Who among the observers of the fast will get the highest reward?" Rasulullah replied. The one who remembers Allah the most. The man then asked the same question about the performer of the salah, the prayer, the uh, uh, giver of the zakat, and uh, donating in charity, as well as the performer of the hajj. And Prophet ﷺ in every case gave the same answer, saying, he who remembers Allah the most. Um, so this verse that I recited, this, uh, it talks about the believing men and women and the status that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has reserved uh, for such uh, people. And uh, no doubt our sister, uh, Rahimahullah, uh, who uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant a jannah al firdaus and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all her shortcomings. And of course, we remember her on this day. And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us all to draw in inspiration um, and, 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 and be uh, just a, uh, be able to do a tiny amount of what she has achieved in this world. Jazakumullah uh, khair, Sister Ashraf, for, for allowing me to be a part of this and uh, over back uh, to you, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair, Brother uh, Sultan, for that beautiful recitation and beautiful uh, reflection on that ayah. Thank you so much again. Guys, this is Sultan's first time on Clubhouse. Please show him some love by following him.
you're going to be uh, Sultan, mashallah. He's very humble, but he's a, a huge uh, Quran uh, reciter here in the UK. He's also a TV presenter of the network uh, Islam Channel and does many wonderful things, uh, especially his uh, business, the Nikah Co., which is doing amazing uh, Nikah services here in the UK. Thank you so much again, Brother Sultan. Assalamu alaikum. Just going to do a quick reset of the room. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Strangers uh, Clubhouse. This evening we are remembering the late Dr. Betty Shabazz, our sister, our mother. We're here to honour her and the legacy that she left behind for many of us. Um, it's my pleasure to say that we are going to be uh, joined by some amazing speakers um, from scholars um, to artists and, and poets. And um, I'm, I'm just so happy that everybody is here. Um, please do give um, the Strangers uh, Club a follow. If you just see above my head, it says the Strangers with a green house. Uh, give that follow so that you're up to date with our events. We're going to be holding these spaces once a month. And it, we're going to be honoring uh, the Strangers of our time, uh, both past um, and present, and honoring their lives and how they navigated you know being muslim but also living very public lives uh, such as dr betty shabazz i'm now going to hand over to our brother rakeen who will tell us a bit about rumi's cave who are our co-partners in this event rakeen alhamdulillah sister ash um so yes uh, some of the work that rumi's cave does um, we do work like feeding the homeless and also looking after the elderly as well as having uh, events. So there's um, poetry events there and then there's, there's different events with knowledge. So there'll be knowledge of like tafsir, knowledge of fiqh. And then the founder, uh, Sheikh Babika, is the one who does um, lots of, of lectures and giving lots of dawah to the new Muslims and also people that have been Muslims for a long time about you know, the, how to be good citizens and how to um, develop in their Islam and mashallah. So Sheikh Babika, he's been doing dawah uh, in the UK from now for the last uh, 35 years. And we're very happy um, to have him here with us today. We're just, I'm, I'm just working behind the scenes. We're trying to get him on, onto, uh, uh, onto our stage. This is the first time on Clubhouse, but we will get there, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. So, yes, uh, so Rumi's Cave is a place, it's open now and it's open to everyone. And also we do a lot of work with the, with the new community, people, uh, the young um, boys and girls that find themselves uh, getting into trouble off the path uh, of the Dean of Islam. And then we do lots of uh, lectures and dawah to bring them back to the path of Islam and also invite um, uh, people who are interested in Islam to join Islam. So we have had, in, uh, over the last um, 10 years, many shahadas, many people joining Islam. Um, and the way that we try to show them the good example of Islam is usually just through um, food, giving them food, and also showing a non-judgmental side. So this is um, Rumi's Cave. And back to you, Ash. Thank you for that, uh, for the introduction there, Brother Rakeem. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, my sister, uh, Taslim Jamila Firdos. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Taslim. I'm just going to give you a quick introduction. Sister Taslim has joined us. She's a multidisciplinary artist, an educator, a health consultant, and author. Taslim is also the founder of My Soul Speaks Institute, Firdosa Counseling and Art as a Sacred Podcast. With masters in, in spiritual culture and health, she is often sought after to speak nationally and internationally on topics of cultivating the divine femininity, art as healing, black Muslims and, and mystical uh, poetry. Thank you so much, Sister Salim. Uh, we, look, we look forward to hearing uh, about your reflections on the late Dr. Betty Sabash. Thank you. Over to you. Oh, Assalamu alaikum. And um, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here to talk about someone like Dr. Betty Shabazz. She means so much to so many of us and just her, her legacy of being a woman who you saw on the front lines even after her husband 
was martyred and to continue to be strong in the cause for humanity. And so I want to share two poems with you today. And the first one, it's a poem I wrote about dedicated to my ancestors. And I think about Dr. Betty Shabazz's history and her history of growing up in Detroit and having um, troubled childhood and the roots in the southern states in the U.S. Um, So uh, similar to a lot of Black people in America. And so this first was just a dedication to just the, the ancestors. I'm reclaiming everything my ancestors prayed for. Rebirthing legacies that got left at shores. Reactivating activities and actions aligned that restore my high vibrational core. I come from those Southern farmers and Baptist preachers. Shy town imams and West African mystical teachers, psychic mamas, village healers, Sunday punillers, dream catchers when everyone else tried to steal us. Those warrior women who fight with spirit and gun. Those men whose bravery is unparalleled, brighter than the sun, where grandmama's cooking is a conjuring, bringing heaven from hell. Those who got royalty in their sails. I come from those who fly with angels, who see life from every angle. From women who put rose quartz under pillows, who convene in sacred circles so generations can still grow. I come from Mississippi and Alabama healers who resurrect everybody, they mama and the dealers, who sang freedom songs, who are God-like strong, who transform front porches to become the community congregation. Kitchens are the sacred sanctuary, feeding souls and bellies with jarred jellies and herbal salves and elixirs to fix her after broken hearts and abortions with distortions as we are reclaiming queens with the royal rituals, transformative tinctures, getting back to plants and soup bones, water bowls and crystal stones, deep pentatonic tones, moaning music, even our living rooms with vicar healing, prayer circles and hand claps, making possibilities plentiful with the mind traps. From the mind traps with our spirit imaginations, water rooms and shucking corn, elevating us, reborn with the healing okra soup. I'm from those who hold self-governing elder sessions, who listen to prophecy, that root connection. We are earth people, which anchors me in power and allow me to fly free. They hold freedom in their eyes and hands. They are beauty boomers. The ancestors are calling us into grandma's bosoms in the backyards, baking, shaking us up, waking us up, creating love beyond this realm to fill a piece of peace to Sankofa to spring forth. And we hold on till they pray us whole. They are whole. They pray us whole. Please pray us whole. My next poem I wrote specifically for Dr. Betty Shabazz, and it is um, titled Mama Betty. Mama Betty was chosen, and she knows him, in and out when world throws him back in her arms. She's armed her spirit to alarm her hearing to the divine assignment, warrior soldier in alignment with her royal refinement the spark in the fire. Even when tired, her job was to inspire. How do you prepare for, except with continuous prayer pours that drowns with shoreless bliss, raised fists, placing paradise plates with grapes and not knowing if this is your last kiss with children tied on backs and hips? Do you need a gun cock with clips any moment ready to rip? Because this This is not a phase. This is all her days, cloudy or sun rays, fog or haze. Believe high in the mission. Modded your ego self for the cause. Created revolutionary transformation without pause or pardon. Ripping weeds out for plentiful gardens. And the garnish was sometimes bitter. 
like dandelion tea, lioness seeds bloom, vigor, victorious vessel, God's submission rigor, racing for the great, shakes up over the heavens with vision straight. You from that Shabazz tribe, trailblazing traits, weight heavy realms lift you to leveled states and all with the crown on tight. Beautiful brown intellectual tone and spiritual insight. Six babies birthed in divine flight and righteous fights. Muted the gossip. Status swole on prosper. Assistant and supreme partner. Grow old. Those golden goals got altered. Pregnant with two daughters when he was martyred. Who heard the stories? and wiped the tears and hid the fears and soothed the hearts year after year. You, while Malcolm was out in the streets, you creating peace at home. Foundation loved on loyalty to the cause of freedom. You had to be on a whole nother paradigm, honing your godly skills, determination, discipline, and will. With angels lined, divine design to shield and heal when wide open wounds reside. Boldly brilliant, you keep it committed to family, even when structures would rupture. To our mothers of the path that wrestled wrath with dignity, strength, and tenacity, raised the ranks capacity. I know it was times when you were nervous with this weighty purpose, and may Allah love and reward her for years of service, and forgive her and grant her genital for dose. And may Allah continue to draw Mama Betty close. I mean, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Thank you for having me. And um, may Allah reward this event and all that you do um, in the name of Allah. Thank you. Jazakallah khair, Sister Taslim. That was, that was absolutely beautiful and, and so, so moving. Jazakallah khair. You, you honestly... Uh, I'm completely captivated by you, my sister, Jasakallah Khairan, uh, for being here. May Allah love her and el elevate her, Mama Shabazz. Jasakallah Khairan, that was, was really, really touching. Thank you very much. I'm just going to give a quick reset to the room. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to remembering Dr. Betty Shabazz under the Strangers uh, Club here on Clubhouse. Thank you so much for joining us and our honored speakers here. You've just heard from Sister Taslim Jamila. Please give her a follow to find out more about her work. Um, that was a tired. It's just no good. Wow, that's so scary, wasn't it? Sorry, sorry about that. Um, if you followed uh, Sister Taslim on her Instagram to find out more about her work, thank you again, Sister Taslim. Um, we'll now have um, uh, Abdullah Molim giving an intro to our second speaker, uh, Rakeen Niaz. Abdullah, if you could introduce our speaker, please. Right, I'm unmuting myself. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, if you're in America. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for my sister to organize this incredible event and learning so much about uh, a truly remarkable woman in uh, Betty Shabazz. Um, so yeah, Rakeen Nias is an educator who is presently head of religious education in a secondary school in North London. Rakeen has studied the Dean of Islam with many scholars, including Sheikh Babakir, and is presently a murid of Imam Sheikh Tijani Sise, to name just a few. He's also a qualified relationship coach and the arts director and spiritual advisor at Rumi's Cave. And he published his first book of poems called Third Eye last year. So it's absolutely delighted to introduce brother Rakeen. So the floor is yours, my brother. Sayyidina Muhammad and Abduhu wa Rasulu, in Allah, whom Allah ikatu who you solo ala nabi, ya ayuhaladina amano solo wale yo salimu tasliman, Allahumma soli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al Fatilim Oglik wa Kati Lima Sabak Nasir Hakabi Hak, Walahadi ala Sulatik al Mustafim, wa ala Ali Hakan Kadri Dawladim, ya rubbish on the Sadri, wa ya sela Amri, Walla Uzdim and the Sadak of Kauli, Walla Hawla, Walla Kawat, Ela Bilahi Wali Waladi Amabad, ya rubbish in the Ilma. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Alhamdulillah, 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us to gather and I'd like to thank uh, Sister Ash uh, for the idea of putting on such an important and brilliant event to celebrate one of um, our great role models and uh, salam alaikum to all of the guests, the Imam Zaid and uh, all of our, our guests, esteemed guests that we have and also like the Sister Taslim um, I really enjoyed your poetry. It was really beautiful and touching, and right on the spot of what we were, what we're here to do today. So, I'd like to start off with one verse of the Quran where Allah states, "O oh men, we have created you out of a male and a female, and have made you into nations and tribes, so that you might come to know one another. Truly, the noblest among you." In the sight of Allah is the one who is deeply conscious of him. Behold, he is all-knowing, all-aware. And this verse is really um, pointing for what we're talking about today because this um, verse is showing us that the best of us are the ones who are God-conscious. The best of us are those who are aware of Allah, those who have taqwa, those who are full of good deeds. These are the best of us, and it can be male or female. And I remember uh, one sheikh saying to me that in this, in the end times, you will see um, some of the most righteous of the believers will be the women, of the women folk. And today we're here to celebrate uh, the life of one of our great role models. And something interesting because I, I have many brothers and sisters from America. And sometimes they, they get surprised when they, uh, when they see how important um, Dr. Betty Shabazz and definitely al Haj Malik Al-Shabazz, how important they are to people outside of America. Because uh, these are role models for every single uh, black person and also to every single person who is facing a struggle. They are the role models for all of us. Starting off with Islam, when we think about great role models, female great role models, of course we have to start off with our mother, Khadija Radala Anha, the first wife of our beloved Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we know when he was married to her, he didn't marry any other woman. And she was uh, before she was his his um, his business um, boss. Afterwards, when they were married, she became his companion, advisor, and support. And then also uh, another great woman is our mother Sayyida Aisha Radhiya Anha, another wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and our beloved Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi is famous to have said. You can learn half of your deen from Aisha. You can learn half of your deen. So this is, uh, you could say, one of the first scholars of Islam. And Rasulullah made it clear that um, this is someone who is knowledgeable in the deen. In, in, in Senegal, one of the famous uh, women is called Sayyidah Fatima Zahra. She was a hafiz of the Quran and someone that was a great support to her husband, Sayyidi Ali, and also she was someone that gave her life to teaching the Quran and also looking after the, the orphans, the, 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 the ill, the sick. Um, someone was full of, of humility and also a great example for us. Another one, Nana Asma'u, the daughter of Sheikh Uthman Danfodio and the founder of the Yantaru organization, which is a group of educated women who went out to the villages to educate other women. And Sheikh Uthman Danfodia, and he's famous for reviving Islam in Nigeria, but he's also famous for championing Islamic knowledge for the women. In his time, he took women out of their houses and brought them to the masjid. And some of the scholars of the time were challenging him, saying that he was causing fitna by bringing the women to the masjid. And he, and he was famous to say to them, to the scholars that know, I'm not causing fitna. What I'm doing is that I am educating the women. His words were, the evil of leaving women in ignorance 
not knowing what is encompassed upon them, not knowing Islam at all is greater than the evil of their mixing with men. For the first evil relates back to religion, which is faith, Islam and good works. And the second evil relates to genealogy. Our great woman that we're looking at today, Dr. Betty Shabazz. We know behind every great man is a saying, behind every great man is a great woman. Well, the great man, uh, a role model for me, someone that when I read his autobiography, um, it, it changed me. It was uh, inspirational. And to know um, that there was a great woman by his side, uh, Dr. Betty Shabazz. For seven years, they were married. <clears throat> and for over three decades, until she died in 1997, Shabazz's role as the formidable uh, family backbone, family backbone to her husband, and her efforts in preserving after he was assassinated, her efforts, her efforts in preserving Malcolm's legacy after his death need to be celebrated. So she wasn't only a widow of Malcolm, but a great role model and someone that we can learn even, uh, she knew that the importance of education. So she spent her life, first of all, as a single mother at that time, bringing up her six daughters and bringing them up to, uh, emotionally, physically, intellectually, so they became you know, the brilliant um, role models that we see today. This is the first amazing thing that she did. And imagine doing all of this, going through or carrying the trauma of seeing your, uh, your, your husband being assassinated in front of you. Imagine the, 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 the strength of this woman, the, 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 the power of this woman, to be able to see your husband be assassinated in front of you and to carry on, to, to look after, to bring up and be the support, emotional, spiritual, educational support for, for your family. And then after that, being able to go back um, to university until she reached the level of becoming professor. This is something truly, truly remarkable. So she was a truly remarkable woman. And, and uh, I have a quote here from her, her daughter, one of her daughters, Iyasa al-Shabazz, who talks about her mother. And she said, she was truly a remarkable woman. She gave to me, my five sisters and friends, so much unconditional love. She was smart and she was trustworthy. You could ask her any question you had, whether because of self-doubt or wanting to understand something better, she always took the time to give constructive feedback and encouragement. Dr. Betty Shabazz, she knew the importance of education. She understood that for black people growing up in America and everywhere in the Western world, education is the secret key that will open up many doors that are locked for black people. And I don't want to take um, too much time because I know there is uh, more esteemed guests who have um, some great pearls of wisdom to pass with us. So, uh, alhamdulillah, I would just uh, say... One of the things that she said when she was talking about uh, in one of the speeches that she said, a, a focus on brotherhood, she said one of the greatest blessings a man could have is a true brother, a true friend. When we want for our brother the same thing that we want for ourselves, the well-being of our brother becomes our well-being. His security becomes our security. His happiness becomes our happiness. Also, his pain and sorrow becomes our pain and sorrow. His problems become our problems as brothers if we could live up to this. And this is amazing because these words are so poignant even today. If we could look after each other, this is um, the way forward. May Allah bless the soul of Dr. Betty Shabazz and her great husband, al Haj Malik al-Shabazz. And may we always keep doing this to uh, bless them and also remember uh, 
their life because they are so important to all of us. Jazakallah khairan, Brother Rakeen, uh, for your beautiful reflections on Dr. Betty Shabazz. Assalamu alaikum to everybody who's joined us this evening. We are remembering the late Dr. Betty Shabazz under the Strangers uh, Club on on here uh, on Clubhouse. Uh, please do give the club a follow so that you can be kept up to date with all our coming events. Uh, we're joined by wonderful speakers today. Some are on stage already, uh, like my, uh, my auntie, uh, Dr. Aisha Aladawiya, Imam Zaid Shakir, my brother Khalil Ismail, my sister Ruqayya, uh, Rakeen Nais, and our sister Manira, who's our next speaker. But this is Clubhouse, and everybody can see that Manira has got a phone call, and um, she's our, our next speaker. Oh, Hamda, she's just finished the phone. So our next um, speaker is uh, Manira Pilgrim, who is an international poet. She is a cultural producer, writer, broadcaster, and co-founder of the Muslim a hip hop spoken duo poetic pilgrimage. It gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome my sister on stage, Manira. Over to you. Thank you. Sister Manira? While we wait for uh, Sister um, Munira to get ready, I'm just going to play a speech of uh, Mama Betty Shabazz, which she did in 1971. Okay, and I believe um, Munira is actually here, so we'll just come back to the speech. Munira, over to you. I'm so sorry. I just don't know how to use these apps. I just don't know how to use this app, so please forgive me. But assalamu alaikum. Um, I feel so small being here, um, but I just am really happy that I am here and for being invited among so many esteemed people. Um, I've been asked to do a few poems, so I'm going to do um, a poem, half a poem, and a long sentence. So I hope that um, you enjoy it. Okay, so the first poem is called The Woman of My Family. Thinking about... Um, you know, just the women of my family and just, I don't know, how, the way how they shape me. I come from a convert family and um, I don't have any women in my family who are Muslim, but they've still helped shape me and um, I really appreciate them. So I wrote this poem for them. Um, Bismillah. The women of my family are graceful, insightful, wise, sensitive, independent, interdependent and dependable. Depending on what's called for at any given time, they are giving and supportive women. Their words are more soothing than the most smoothest of soothsayers. They have marooned, cushioned lips, rounded hips, and a back so straight it leads up to heaven's gate. Mary Magdalene meets Nana the Maroon. The blue and white now eloping in the centre of Khartoum. Joan of Arc, Sojourner Truth, Rabia, El Adawiya, Zaleika, Makida, Frida Kahlo, Nikki Giovanni, Fulan Devi, Hagar Min as Sadan, wife of a prophet and mother of a nation. The women of my family contain them all and more. What's more, the women who raised me are so gifted. They are so, so gifted, it's almost mythic. At minimum, they are mystics. I wouldn't have believed it if I didn't see it with my own eyes. Breathed it in like the kiss of life. The existence of fire in ice. The horizon after night skies. They are the thread of white that separates the day from the night. The specks of black that are fading from my grandmother's eyes. That seems to be the hookum of becoming wise, of being precious and prized, of leading a rich life and just giving, giving, giving abundantly like a willow tree with an endless amount of leaves. Not even autumn can shake you. Like a stake, firmly rooted in the earth, balancing the planet and all of God's creation, see. I've bore witness to women who make something out of nothing, sense out of nonsense. I would tell you I've seen them battle demons, but you would swear that it's a lie. So what else is the beating of drums at a commoner on the Jamaican night skies? What is women lined up in church sanctuaries, speaking with the authority of God, healing the sick with their prayers? 
feeding the poor with their prayers, keeping their families united with their prayers, and they keep on praying because they know the streets of England are not paved with gold. The stories that they were told that made them leave their homes were baseless, but these women... They are the gold that paved the streets, see. I've sat in circles with women drenched in something between sweat and tears. Women of all years calling his name until kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth here and now. We're not leaving. We desire healing and you are the one who we believe in. And even though we may call the divine by a different name, them telling me, teaching me, showing me that he is one and that one has blessed me with my mum. So I say, God bless the woman who bore us. We should all say, God bless the woman who bore us because indeed they are gracious in gold. So that was my first poem. As I said, I've got a poem, half a poem and a long sentence. So now for my long sentence, this is called The Two Bab Black Girls of Medina Bay. Bismillah. The two bab black girls of Medina Bay glisten like Sayyidina Muhammad or Sallallahu Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like Noor, dripping from vicar beads, residue on their face, glow like brown henna before it dries in Senegalese gold and Tuareg silver, a teak rings on the hands of Auliyahs. Her inheritors of God, they supplicate a dua so sincere in English, broken Arabic and barely Wolof. Hat tricks could not shoot nor score more succinctly than their lips that pray at night and say la ilaha illallah in masjids with green domes and makams in blessed villages where the love of Allah is rife. And on to my final poem and it's called well, two titles. The first title is called To All The Men. The long title is To All The Men Who Acts While I'm Single. And really, even though it's entitled To All The Men, this is to myself and a reminder to always seek God first. Um, if I'm looking for a partner, if I'm looking, whether that be in romantic relationships, whether that be in business, if I'm seeking something, to always seek God first in that. It goes like this. They ask me why I'm single. I shy away from the truth. Spiritual women attract broken men and like a nurse, I tend to them. It's not that I've never had relationship, just there's a thin line between lover and healer. I am often both and he is often neither. He is the one in need and I mostly have the ability to rejuvenate when I deplete. They come to me wounded and it was seen my womb has a thing for making my heart their remedy. Them idling on sacred ground, somebody else's sacred house. I act placid as they set God's house alight to keep them warm. And when they're done, I out their flames with acid, scooping up the flesh that's left behind. Knowing these scars will heal with time, because who does not want a woman who can heal like alchemy, who can ease pains and sorrows, mixing elixirs out of tears, cloves and aloes? Please tell me. Who does not want a woman who will give all of herself until she is hollow? God's home is hollow. I am shallow yet drowning still. It's best I'm single. That's God's will. Pen has lifted feather and quill. See, we are remodeling house into home. So the next man who enters will have to take off his shoes and bow at God's throne. And that's me. Thank you so much for having me. Sister Manera. Everybody gives um, Sister Manera a follow to find out the work that Sister Manera does. Please f check out her Instagram page, was, which is linked to her bio. Before we get to our next speaker, um, Khalil Ismail, which will be introduced by uh, Rakeen, let's hear from uh, Dr. Betty Shabazz on the importance of unity amongst uh, Muslims and humanity in general. One of the greatest blessings a man can have is a true brother, a true friend. When we want for our brother the same thing we want for ourselves, the well-being of our brother becomes our well-being. His security becomes our security. His happiness becomes our happiness. But also his pain and his sorrow becomes our pain and our sorrow his problem becomes our problem. As brothers, if we live up to that, and that sisters is involved, perhaps the world wouldn't be 
in the predicament that it's in. Thank you. And that was Dr. Sh uh, Betty Shabazz at university from 1971. This clip will be attached um, when we upload this to our YouTube channel. And uh, there she touched on, uh, you know, the hadith about when one part of the Ummah is hurting, uh, the rest of the world uh, feels that. I'll now hand over to um, uh, Rakeen, who will introduce our next speaker, which I believe uh, is Sheikh Ahmed Barbika. Rakeen? Uh, alhamdulillah. Yes, alhamdulillah. So uh, we have uh, Sheikh Barbika here. Alhamdulillah. Uh, and with Sheikh Barbika, uh, is is not is very well known in the UK, and uh, Sheikh Rabika is someone that um, he is the founder of he's the founder of Rumi's Cave, and also has been involved in Dawa work for over uh, three decades, and founded one of Britain's earliest Islamic study circles at Regent's Park Mosque. Sheikh Rabika is also the director and founder of Rumi's Cave and also a charity called Ulfa Aid, a global humanitarian relief charity. Sheikh Babika has lectured on Islam across the world and is passionate about promoting the ethical and spiritual teachings of Islam and interfaith dialogue. Alhamdulillah, we're very happy to have Sheikh Babika with us today. So without further ado, I give you Sheikh Babika. Uh, Shake, but the, you might have to uh, uh, unmute. Was at the bottom, the bottom right of the screen. Oh, sorry, sorry. Salam Alhamdulillah. Alaykum. How are you today? You all right? Alhamdulillah, Shake. Mashallah, mashallah. Jazakallah khair, my brother. Oh, thank uh, you so much. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum. My sister and brother. Aaudhu billahi min al-shaytan al-rajim. Bismillahi rahman rahim Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-mursaleen Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi ajma'in. Rabbi shrahli sadri. ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يبقه قولي ربي أودعني أن أشكر نعمتك التي أنعمت علي وعلى والدي وأن أعمل صالحا ترضاه وأصلح لي في ذريتي إني تبت إليك وإني من المسلمين uh, My dear brothers and sisters in Iman uh, I am grateful uh, to Rakeen for the invitation to speak about some important member of the community of Muslims who are in this day and age in need of recognition, in need of someone to recognize what they are doing as being something good, especially at a time whereby Muslims have been seen through the media, whether it is television or social media, whether it is radio or newspapers, as the people who are bringing troubles to the world. And yes, we can see the significant work that has been done by fringe groups such as Shabab and Daesh and Boko Haram and from West Africa to East Africa to Arabia. All that which we see, which does not really speak about Islam or represent Islam, but in the modern world that we live in, only bad news can become news. Only a lie can become the truth. Everything has been exchange or change into something that is not acceptable. So as Muslims, we need to put things in the right way. One of the things that made me happy that this subject is being chosen, because we live at a time whereby women are fighting for their rights. Subhanallah. Yani 1400 years since the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent as a mercy to the world and he significantly changed the life of women in Arabia and across the world. He did everything possible to show the world that women and men are equal in everything that is spiritual. The only difference is between them in the physical nature Allah created them and the responsibilities that come thereafter. In the differences that all we know and we understand in the bi biological where Allah created us. Other than that, they are equal. Equal in every aspect of living, in doing their worship of Allah subhanahu 
وتعالى in the 21st century the women are fighting still for their right women still are fighting to find equal pay which is absolutely shocking and amazing women are still still fighting to be treated as human beings and it is not shocking because even in so called the modern uh, advanced technology wise uh, western world in many countries women did not get the freedom of even voting until the 70s and that is a shocking thing to say so uh, for me remembering betty is something important especially in america whereby she is not just a woman she is a black woman and blacks are fighting for their rights but my question why should we remember why should we bring the memories of people who passed away why should we sit down and talk about them what comes to my mind is a very beautiful statement in a hadith said by rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he says This is Aisha reporting the hadith of Allah, the wife of Rasulullah when she said, Udhkuru mahasina mawtakum. Remember the best your deceased has accomplished in their life. And subhanallah, today when you meet people uh, in graveyard burying somebody or going to give condolences into their homes, people only remember the best things and talk and chit chat and gossip. Yet the instruction that is clear, remember the best that they have done. anything else has no value and therefore we remember a person by bringing the best that they have done so that we can take an example of that so that our iman can be strengthened so that our will to live to do good will be given a boost because most of us need an example you know, after all sayyidna muhammad sallallahu was sent as an example لقد كان لكم في رسول الله اسوة حسنة indeed in the messenger of Allah you have the best of examples in the reminder itself Allah mentioned this in three different verses Allah says first to Sayyidina Muhammad sallam فذكر إن نفعت الذكرى O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do remind if your reminder will be of benefit so that if it is not going to benefit Why waste your time? In a second occasion, Allah said to the Prophet ﷺ, فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ الذِّكْرَ تَنْفُعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ O Muhammad ﷺ, yes, do remind. For indeed your reminder will benefit the believers. Those who believe in the cause, they will carry that message. And they will take that lesson. In the third occasion, Allah said, فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُذَكِّرْ لَسْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِمُصَيْتَرْ Do remind them, O Muhammad Sallam, and remember, you are just there to remind them. You have no power to compel them. For indeed, there is no compulsion in religion. You can compel people. Either they choose to believe or not. Just remind them, for your duty is to remind them. Lest alayhim bi musaytir, you are not to compel them. You have no power to compel them. This remind me, in this moment we are reminding one another, we need to remember what we say is to make sure that those people who believe in the cause of advancing the women of today are removing them from the position that they are fighting to remove them from is advanced, inshallah. Now I come to our sister, Betty, And why should we remember her? I say to myself, when I'm thinking about somebody like her, today America is considered to be the most powerful nation living on the earth. It's considered to be the leading democratic nation. It's considered to be the nation that is the richest. But when I look back and I see what America did to my sisters and brothers from Africa and the slavery that has taken place and the wickedness and the evil that has done place not a thousand years ago not even 500 or 300 years ago up to the 60s 
And indeed, some of it is taking place today in the discrimination that we see. How sad we see this. This woman, her legacy is a lesson for anybody who is seeking justice. Her life is an amazing life because really, subhanallah, she didn't live long. She didn't marry when she was very old. She didn't convert to Islam as an old woman. But she was young. She lived a humble, simple life. She's been raised not by her parents. But Allah has put in the destiny of this woman something to be an example for others. You don't have to be born in a rich house. You don't have to be born with the comfort of fulfilling what you want because the means are there to fulfill. But if you have the will and you strive, Allah will guide you. Indeed, he said in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا Those who will strive toward us, we will guide them into our path. This woman coming, not by accident visiting the nation of Islam, but by a prescribed destination from Allah for her to be there to see a man whom Allah has chosen for her to be her husband. For indeed before women and men get married on the earth, their nikah or their wedding will take place in the heaven. This is what we understand and what we believe in. So, she converted to Islam, she married a man who had a troubled life before he became a Muslim, and as if Allah wanted to comfort him, to give him someone to support him, as Khadija was given to the Prophet, marrying two men, having a child, she's in her 40s, yet the Prophet was only 25 when she approached him and asked him for marriage. Not because she wanted to marry just a young man, not just because she wanted a companion to be with her in her life, but because she saw in him that which no other man has. Dignity, honor, humility, and above all, truthfulness and honesty. She has chosen someone who can fulfill for her what she seeks. She seeks in her life or she wants. And therefore, in the same way, Betty has seen in Malcolm that will of wanting to bring the truth out. What is his problem? What was he saying so that he could be killed? He was guided to Islam. The nation of Islam did him a favor with all the wrong people might say about the nation, but without the nation he would not have been the Muslim he was. So they were instrumental, like bringing Muhammad Ali to Islam. However, when he understood that Islam is not a cult, Islam is not a group cutting people, Islam calls for the one under the umbrella of the one message that was brought by all the messengers to the seal of prophets, Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu to be delivered, not to his nation or his people in Arabia, but to all of mankind. So the one is indicating that now the message is completed, it should be taken by everyone, united in spirit, to fulfill for humanity what they have been created for. So Betty, her life was already been planned for her. But what makes me think now, living in a world today whereby, when I, as an educator working in a school, they give us indicators that a child would not succeed if he is born in a poor house, living in government properties, uh, receiving uh, support from the government, having free meals in the schools, uh, raised by one woman or by a single parent. On the contrary, if you look at the life of great prophets like Musa, if you look at the life of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu they were raised by women. They were cared for by women. And they were looked after until they became the best of men. And in this, I will say that this woman, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, has made her an example by allowing her to live a very short life in Islam and being a wife 
to one of the most important Muslims in America at that time, maybe in the world, to show the world that this man who came from a home of slaves, who was never given the chance to represent himself properly, he had no will of his own. He is unknown by naming himself X. He doesn't know his roots. His wife chose the same thing. The reason is to make sure that the world will know in this advanced, democratic, most powerful nation in the world, the wrong is being done. In many cases, under the umbrella or the name of God. And that is absolutely unfitting for God, for people to be abused and misused, mistreated under the name of God. Just like these so-called Muslim groups doing all this in the name of God, that which is seen to be evil, and it is evil, the same thing was done for the Africans who were taken from Africa and abused in America. And this woman and her husband, they are that legacy. And therefore, when she was given that opportunity to see her husband die before her, and she was left with children as a single woman, not raising a child or two, and I know as a father of two, it's not easy to raise children, but six of them. She did not just put herself in her house receiving help just to look after those kids, but she went out and did what the Prophet asked for. Seek knowledge. Even if it is going to be harsh and terrible, okay, in the saying he says, even if it is in China, meaning if, even if you have to trouble yourself and be in difficulty, go and seek that knowledge. She went and not just got a degree with an understanding of doing a job to earn a wage, but she went further until she achieved the highest accolade of education to become a doctor, to teach in university, and to become an example for others. This is what we need to remember of a woman who married young, her life was cut short in marriage by her husband taken away while he was young. She never chose to fulfill her desires of having another man as a companion to share her life with someone. That wasn't her concern. Her concern was the legacy that her husband has left trying to bring to the attention of the world there is no difference between black and white, and there is no difference between humans. And therefore, if you listen to her talks, when she talks about brotherhood, it is absolutely befitting that she should be remembered. Because the Quran is speaking about brotherhood. Islam is about brotherhood. The Prophet says, Al Mu'min Akhul Mu'min. The believer indeed is a brother of the believer. Al Muslim Akhul Muslim. The Muslim in faith is the brother of the Muslims. That is very important. But many people don't understand brotherhood. Brotherhood is not just your brother who comes from your lineage, your bloodline. In Islam, we understand, yes, that is your brother. Or you have your brother in humanity. Or you have your brother in faith, like the people of the book and other religion. Or you have your brother in Islam. The one who declared, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. She was talking about that. She wants people to understand that. That is absolutely important. And one of the most beautiful things the Prophet ﷺ said about brotherhood, one day he was sitting and he says to the companions who were close to him and who loved him so much, they will give their life to him. He says, Inni ashtaqu ila ikhwani. I yearn for my brothers. The companions looked at him in an amazement and said, Ya Rasulullah, alasna ikhwanuk, aren't we your brothers? He says, no. Imagine, he's telling them that, no, you're not my brother. You are my companions. But he said, my brothers, those who will come after my demise, after I die, they will come later. One of them will wish to give all his wealth just to have a glimpse to see my face. That is what people like Betty, may Allah bless her soul, and her husband Malcolm X were trying to guide the world through. We human beings, we come from the same source. Spiritually, we come from the same spirit. And physically, we come from the same body. Spiritually, we come from a ruh. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created it before he created Adam, the body. By 2,000 years of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, I was the Prophet and Adam was still mud and water. Literally meaning the physical body was created after the spirit. And all the human spirits were created from one spirit, 
and all the human bodies, they stem and they come from the same body. And therefore, it is absolutely not befitting for humans who believe and trust in the message of Allah to fight one another, to envy one another, to hate one another, to do evil towards one another. But they should all be brothers, holding on one another, supporting one another. And Rasulullah says, none of you is a true believer until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. I ask you, my sisters and brothers, is it that I love for my brother to own a big house, to have the best car, to earn the highest salary? What is the best thing can I wish for my brother? I wish for my brother to leave this world with the best of good deeds. As Allah says, فَتَزَوَّدُوا فَإِنَّ خَيْرِ ذَلِ التَّقْوَى Indeed, take provision for the best provision is taqwa. I wish and I hope for my brothers to have that so in the day of judgment they can be relieved of their sin, forgiven and raised to the highest loftiest place in Jannah. Today, when I look at my brothers, my own blood brothers and sisters, my own uh, Muslim brothers and sisters, my own believing brothers among the Christian and the Jews and my human brothers, whom the majority of them are further away from faith, are distant, but not because they don't want, but because there is no examples for them. We should be the examples. You are the best of people brought forth to mankind. Where are you? What are you doing? But you are fighting one another. You are envious with one another. Look at us, how divided we are. How insular we are becoming, neglecting our job in becoming the examples as inheritors of this religion to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we are ambassadors to deliver this message because he is no longer here if somebody asks me or you Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not come to us each one of us could say I am Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam not by just words but by deed as he says convey salam to everyone you know or you don't know and share your food with everyone you know or you don't know if we do that then we are showing mercy and we are welcoming people to the paths of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I wish for my brothers in humanity who are not Muslims not to die as mushriks or non-believers. I wish for them to die as Muslims so that they will not enter the hellfire. That is my hope, inshallah. And finally, if there is anything to say about this woman, that in a day and age whereby I could see my brothers and sisters in America among the African Caribbean and African American communities fighting for their rights don't let anything stop you from speaking the truth and being honest in whatever you do or you say for indeed the truth will always remain and falsehood forever will vanish there's no time for fear there's no time for hiding there is no time for stopping the truth from being declared highly. Malcolm X was hated by everyone. People think only the nation of Islam because he's dividing them. No. The main community who was not allowing the African American in America to stand for their right and to be given the right of everything as normal human beings he was speaking loudly and saying, no, you can't say you believe in God and you treat me in this way. You can't lift the Bible above your head or lift the Quran above your head or the Torah above your head and say, I believe in it, I believe in God, and then go and treat human beings in the way you treat them. Nothing to do with oppression, nothing to do with putting people down or even humiliating or insulting or demeaning them will be befitting a believer. Sister Betty, wherever she might be, may Allah forgive her sins, erase all her bad deeds and exchange them to good deeds and raise her to the highest, loftiest place in Jannah. And may she be with her husband. And I finally say this word. Two things stuck in my mind when I was remembering her to say those words I had been given the permission to say that she died when she was 63. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died when he was 63 years old. Her husband died 
at the martyr because he was killed. And subhanallah, the cause of her death was fire. And the Prophet ﷺ says, anybody who drowns, anybody who is killed by fire, or anybody who died like a woman in labor, or somebody is being attacked and killed by somebody else, they will die as martyrs. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us that she is going as a martyr from this world. May Allah bless her soul, erase her, and give her the tawfir to be, inshallah, one day in a position to be in her position, be in the ta'ala. Jazakumullah khair, wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Babika, for those wonderful reflections and amin to your beautiful du'as. Sheikh Babika touched on the marriage there between Malcolm X and Betty Shabazz and they faced hardship when they were together and Dr. Betty faced even more hardship after um, Malcolm was brutally murdered um, in front of her. And we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Shabazz's eldest daughter, Atala, as she recalls what life was like for her mother, uh, Betty Shabazz, after uh, the assassination of um, Brother Malcolm. But you couldn't miss her in the East, because right. she was part of everything, you know, in the East Coast. And um, has a personality. I mean, when one says her name, it's almost a, a associate, uh, associated to an adjective, mm -hmm. you know, um, the nature, the being, the yeah. presence. Uh-oh, here comes Dr. Shabazz, you know, that kind of, <laughs> that kind of thing. As yeah. a professor, as a teacher, um, as a maternal mentor, she never stopped. But what people don't realize is that with all of that strength was the vulnerability of having been um, left here mm -hmm. without her husband. My f mother was a perpetual wife even when my father was killed. So she never lived the life of a widow. Mm -hmm. It was as if he was still here. So her commitment to him when she said, I do, was with her until she made her transition. Wow. And that was Atala Shabazz, the eldest daughter of Malcolm and Dr. Betty Shabazz just call, um, recalling what life was like for her mother. And like she said, um, Dr. Betty remained a perpetual um, widow. Even if she wanted to move on in peace, she could never move on because she was constantly reminded that she was the wife of a very controversial figure. Um, and many of her friends recall and say that they could have forgiven her t uh, to retire and just, you know, raise her six daughters. Um, you know, she lost him when she was 28 years old. So she was very young and she could be forgiven to just go into the background and, ha and lead a private life. But she chose um, to lead a very upfront uh, public life. She put her six daughters through private education. She then wanted to obtain two degrees for herself while she held and... Um, held up the legacy of her, her husband, Malcolm X, but then she forged her own, mashallah. We're going to hear from more of our speakers now. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome our next speaker, Brother Yanis Mahil, who's joining us from all the way in France. Brother Yanis is a French and Moroccan scholar in Islamic studies and a specialist on Malcolm X. Brother Yanis, thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salatu wassalam ala ashraf al-mursalin Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. So thank you uh, first of all for organizing this event to honor uh, this great woman and sister, Dr. Betty Shabazz, also known as uh, Al-Hajja Bahia Shabazz. And uh, you know, as, as you mentioned, uh, I'm working since years on Brother Malcolm, and uh, I'm, um, I'm writing a book about his life, and you can't work on Brother Malcolm and uh, without having a knowledge of the life of this woman, Betty Shabazz. And when you are studying uh, any historical figure, you can't avoid studying the people who were around them, uh, both their friends, their partners, and their families. And sometimes we focus on Malcolm because he was, you know, this great leader and very charismatic. 
and uh, we forget that uh, around him you had also very great uh, and very important and powerful men and women. And uh, Beri Shabazz, of course, uh, is among them. And we should keep in mind that when Malcolm, Brother Malcolm, has been assassinated, she was very young because she was younger than him, and she was about uh, 30 years old, and uh, she had to to raise six very young daughters uh, alone uh, as a widow and also carry on her shoulders uh, the weight uh, of the legacy of Malcolm X, and it's not easy because you have, of course, the legacy of Malcolm X as a great leader, thinker, activist, but you have also the weight of his assassination. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, Betty Shab- Dr. Betty Shabazz was a w- direct witness of it. So uh, carrying this uh, is very difficult for any human being. So carrying this legacy and raising uh, her daughters was her jihad. And it was a great jihad. And uh, alhamdulillah, in many ways, she was uh, successful uh, because we know that Beri Shabazz focused uh, on the issue of education and of the, the knowledge of self. And we see that it was an important point uh, in raising her daughters. She wanted to give to give her uh, to give to them the best education and at the same time knowledge of self. You should know who you are as uh, African-Americans, as Muslims. And one element among others, uh, Dr. Betty Shabazz sent uh, her daughters uh, to study uh, Islam and Arabic and African uh, history uh, at the Mosque of Islamic Brotherhood in uh, Harlem with uh, the late Sheikh uh, Allama Tawfiq, uh, who was uh, the former imam and leader uh, of this masjid uh, in Harlem. And uh, Ilyasa Shabazz reported in uh, one of her book how these teachings with uh, Sheikh Tawfiq were important, important for her and her sisters uh, in knowing who they are and uh, also see how the official, uh, like the, the dominant ideology in America and the dominant education was in fact based upon uh, a white narrative and having this alternative education to really study uh, African history and Islam and the history of Islam and Muslims was very important in their journey. And in this way, we see how uh, Beri Shabazz was following the same path of her late husband, Malcolm X. And, you know, she was also uh, a member of the Nation of Islam. And she has this uh, religious and, I would say, political consciousness like her husband uh, had also. And, you know, Malcolm X was so intellectually powerful that uh, he was growing very, very quickly. And even before Hajj, you know, some people think that he started his uh, evolution after Hajj, but he started a long time before. And Malcolm was growing very quickly, and some of his uh, followers and very close partners have said later that it was difficult to follow him because, you know, they had some, uh, uh, you know, an, an ideology, some thoughts, and Malcolm was changing and growing, and it was sometimes difficult to follow him. And we see that at the end of the day, his wife always followed him. She was faithful to him and was growing with him and even helping him in his uh, evolution. And we can see that a uh, few times uh, after uh, Malcolm's assassination, Beri Shabazz herself went uh, to Mecca to perform Hajj, to perform the pilgrimage, and her, herself leave uh, what her husband a few times before uh, had had lived 
and and get the same uh, experience, huge experience, humanly and spiritually. How uh, how he's powerful and he's he can change the mind uh, of a person. And uh, she wanted to you know also to keep this connection with uh, the Muslim world and the Muslim community. And we also uh, have uh, some people who were more or less uh, around her and uh, were very instrumental in, uh, I would say, uh, keeping the Islamic side of this family. And we have the honor to have also uh, in this room uh, with us, Sister Aisha Ladawiya, who is a very great woman and sister and who was part uh, also of uh, of this work uh, in trying to uh, to always uh, be supportive to Sister Beri Shabazz uh, and also trying to how can I say this like to keep uh, alive the Islamic side uh, and legacy of this uh, wonderful and amazing family so I, I just wanted to point out how it's an honor to have this sister with uh, with us uh, tonight. And I wanted to add also that uh, beyond supporting the legacy of Malcolm X, like uh, and uh, seeking for the truth about what happened to him and about the murder of Brother Malcolm, she also used Betty Shabazz used her symbolic power to support justice. She was always talking about injustices uh, against uh, African Americans uh, in US and uh, she, she was in touch with some activists of her time after Malcolm, she was in touch with uh, the Black Panther Party and others and we know also that she she had a network with uh, like the, the widow of Martin Luther King and they tried to, to put together some uh, projects and to support the legacies of their late husbands, to support education for young people. So many, many very uh, important things that they were involved in. And, uh, uh, you know, many things have been written, uh, many wrong things have been written about uh, the relationship between Malcolm X and Betty Shabazz. The reality that their marriage was based upon a very deep love and faithfulness and uh, uh, I remember I, I interviewed someone uh, who who was uh, uh, the part a partner of brother Malcolm and he was his uh, main uh, uh, contact in Paris in France and when Malcolm came to France during one week to deliver a speech in Paris and having other uh, stuff uh, he told me we were in his uh, home at a hotel and Malcolm was telling him how much his daughters and his wife were missing him, how much he was missing them. And uh, uh, Betty Shabazz was always in the mind of Malcolm and we can see it also when you read uh, the letters and the postcards that Malcolm was sending to her when he was abroad and overseas. He was always uh, including Betty in his mind and his, his project. And he said a uh, few months before he passed how much he regretted to have not brought with him uh, uh, during his travel abroad, his family, and especially, of course, uh, Dr. Betty Shabazz. He regretted it. And he said that he wanted to, to, to bring her the next time, but unfortunately... Uh, he was not able to, to do it. And, you know, we have a quote saying that uh, you can assess the value of, uh, of someone through the education that he gave to his children. And when we see uh, the quality of the, the, the leadership and the insights uh, uh, of uh, Ilyasa Shabazz and Atala Shabazz, we can see how uh, Sister Bailey Shabazz was uh, effective in her uh, in her work, and she is she is definitely a role model. She is definitely a role model, and you know we need to have role models uh, uh, as as Muslims, and of course we have the Prophet Muhammad and his companions 
but we need also to have more uh, uh, contemporary models. Uh, and sometimes, you know, uh, it's easier to, to identify uh, ourselves to some people who are living the same reality that we live, you know. And it's, it's not uh, by accident that from the very beginning, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, uh, brother before me, uh, I think it's Brother Rakin, mentions uh, the verse of the Quran, وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَرَفُوا And this diversity and the universality of Islam was also among the companions of the Prophet Muhammad. And we always mention Bilal, uh, Salman al-Farisi, and we have others. And uh, it, was, it was also a part uh, of the message because having this diversity among the companions, it's like having a diversity among founding fathers and uh, uh, making this universality uh, more uh, practicable for some people around the world. And we can see that, for instance, uh, at one point, the, the people who were following uh, Imam Dabuluddin Muhammad, they were calling themselves Bilalians. So they, they had this identification with Bilal. And uh, having this diversity is also important uh, for, for the Ummah to be able to identify themselves to different role models. And of course, as Muslims, uh, Malcolm X and Betty Shabazz are great uh, role models. And it's important for the new generation to know more about them about the legacy and about what they can still, uh, how they can still contribute to to a better future today. Oh, mashallah, jazakallah, khair, brother Yanis. That was really, really um, exciting, very interesting, and very insightful. Actually, I love the you know the idea when you're, you're talking about um, Malcolm. Um, even regretted not taking, you know, his wife abroad with him, you know, and the love that they shared. Very beautiful, very insightful. I'm just like, for sharing that. Okay, and so now um, we're going to move on uh, and we're going to uh, invite uh, a very um, talented uh, woman uh, poet, who uh, is Rakaya Fatuga, a poet, facilitator, and events producer based in London. Her work joins conversations on overlapping identities, faith and culture as self-affirmation. Rakaya's commissions include work for the BBC, Apple, Bloomberg, Philanthropies, with Vanity Fair, English Touring Theatre, and LinkedIn. Since winning the round as Poetry Slam, Raquel is developing her monodrama, Unbraided, to show at the Roundhouse this July 2021. So, welcome, Raquel. Thank you so much. Asalaamu As Alaikum, everyone. It's really an honour to be here and to listen to all the esteemed speakers and artists as well today remembering such a great woman um i'm just gonna share two poems for now inshallah um manira spoke earlier about her long sentence i think all my poems are really one long sentence uh I, they're all quite short but i'm gonna share this first one which is called moments like now our rightly mothers say we are mules of the earth, carrying the world and treated like dirt. But there are women who keep planting seeds in that ground, who keep growing, surviving, finding moments like now that can breed futures and feed girls and fuel girls with the image of all that they can become. There are women who have always been leaders, from a mother's word, teaching the value of a voice that is heard to the sheikhs and queens that held the legacy of African dreams. Sokoto Yantaro of Nana Asmau, to Ya Ashantiwa on the battlefield, our historical mothers, the real life warriors, teachers, linguists, preachers of find that power that sits within. When divine light shows you yourself, then you have everything. 
So say the women who uplift and protect what is gold. So say the women who are not always centre stage. So often lost from view outside of the frame, but is the air any less vital when we can't see it? Does energy still exist before we free it? Can power cease to be when there is one to decree it? Because I do, my sisters, I witness the power in you. That was Moments Like Now, and I'm just going to read one more poem um, at this stage. And this poem uh, is about a woman in my family who inspired me. Um, And this is called Dada Agnes. The mother of our four generations steps out onto the orange path as Heron's grace lagoons spilled with sunset. She carries decades of wisdom in her patterned drapery. Looking in her eyes is looking into me. Don't cry, she says. Just pray. Every day could be our last day and we live breathing in the echo of the words we say. She takes my hand though she must not remember me, a child of Elsie's Elsie. But I love her through the ropes of legacy. I love her like the song of destiny has called me here to her line. Mourn quick than smile because the slot for life is fine. Time pockets our chances with every beat of a heart. We might drop out of this world before we learn who we are. But our mother shine. Our mother knows that we are vast and holy homes. And there are diamonds in the floorboards of our souls. Jazakallah khairan, that's all from me. Jazakallah khairan, I had a huge smile on my face when you came up. I, I go way back uh, with Rukeya. I knew her as a um, a delightful uh, young uh, uh, girl, and now she's a wonderful young lady. Mashallah, makes me very proud um, to uh, share stage with you. Thank you so much. Uh, Rukeya is also, I believe, um, um, observing all the speakers and she's going to um inshallah towards the end of the evening uh create a poem uh, i think it's called poetic moments where she'll take inspiration from all our speakers this evening and then perform for us at the end um, based on the words that they've shared with us is that correct Rukeya? yes yes that's correct inshallah i'm listening and jotting down notes as we speak jazakallah khairan uh, Rukeya. It gives me now a uh, great pleasure to introduce um, one of my teachers. Um, it's such an honor to have him here with us today, Imam Zaid Shakir. As you know, he doesn't need any introduction, but I'll give a brief one. Imam Zaid Shakir is a co-founder and senior faculty member of Zaytuna College in Berkeley, California. Imam Zaid is amongst the most respected and influential Islamic scholars in the West. Imam Zaid Shakir also serves as an advisor to many organizations and has recently been appointed as the new chair of MANA, the Muslim Alliance in, in North America. Imam Zaid Shakir, Jazakallah Khairan for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, please, the mic is yours. While we wait for our Sheikh to uh, get ready, uh, let's hear um, from uh, Atala Shabazz, the eldest daughter of Malcolm X and Betty Shabazz, on the love. Assalamu alaikum. Here's Imam Zaid Shakir. Assalamu alaikum, Imam. Thank you so much. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. I'm sorry for the slight delay. I had to finish my prayer. So, my thank apologies. You, thank you so much. No, 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 no apologies. You, you've honored us this evening. Jazakallah khair, Imam Zaid Shakir. Um, please, the mic is yours. Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen, Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, it's a great honor to be part of this wonderful program. The incredible lineup of thinkers and poets and poetists. May Allah 
Bless all of you, Sheikh Babakar, who I've been seeing in several years now. It was a pleasure listening to him if he's still on the line. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah bless all of you and uh, may Allah bless you to continue to do all the wonderful things that you all are doing to make things, make the load a little lighter for those people that your, your words and your presence and your thoughts and your work impacts. Alhamdulillah, it's a great opportunity. I see uh, Sister Aisha Adawiya is on or scheduled to be on. And I, I, I mention her because uh, uh, the last time, actually only time that I met with Sister Betty Shabazz at 96th Street Masjid in Manhattan, <clears throat> Manhattan, New York, I believe Sister Aisha was with me and... Uh, there was a group of us. Imam Jamil al Amin was involved with that program. and uh, But Imam Jamil had to leave. So we had a private audience with Dr. Betty Shabazz uh, afterwards. And one thing that she said is, I think is critically important. And, and that is, uh, she said, you Muslims, Sunni Muslims, you Sunni Muslims need to claim Malcolm. Because everyone else is. And... Uh, to paraphrase, that's what he was. He was a Sunni Muslim. And, and so the nationalists claim Malcolm, the socialists claim Malcolm, uh, some Marxists claim Malcolm. Uh, and I think it's very important for us to claim Malcolm, but to claim Malcolm in a way that the socialists, the nationalists, the pan-Africanists, etc., do not claim Malcolm. I think because what we increasingly see are just we're claiming Malcolm in ways that uh, other people are. And not, not to deny that as Muslims there are not components, there are not aspects of our uh, approach to life, our approach to society, our approach to addressing issues of injustice and oppression that are... Uh, reflect some of the teachings of nationalists or socialists or Marxists, etc. But there are also uh, extremely unique teachings that only we Muslims can highlight. And if we neglect those, I think we neglect them to our collective peril. And I think uh, to a certain extent we have neglected them. And so we see our community here in uh, the West facing a very peril perilous situation right now. So to uh, move on to uh, Dr. Betty Shahbaz, uh, I think it's critically important, again, to acknowledge her academic achievements, to acknowledge uh, her, uh, her uh, professorship, and all of those things that were definitely a part of who, of, of, uh, who and what she was. But I think there were very, uh, there was a very uh, telling statement that was made by uh, dear sister Atala Shabazz. And she said, my mother was, she was a perpetual wife. And even after the death of her husband, she didn't cease being a wife. And so these, these are the things I think we can, as we, reflect on other aspects of who Dr. Betty was. Uh, these are things we cannot lose sight of because oftentimes we lose sight in someone like Dr. Betty Shabazz being a doctor and becoming a doctor and being a professor and doing all of those wonderful, incredible things that, that she did and accomplishing all that she accomplished. But what is unique about her so being a doctor isn't unique. There are a lot of women, African-American women, PhDs out there. Uh, there. And many of them have published more in terms of doing the professor thing. They, they've done it uh, to a degree for a number of reasons, not to belittle uh, Dr. Betty's scholarship or her professorship, but they've done it better. But... Who was a better wife than Betty Shabazz? 
who, who helped to provide the home environment and keeping, providing that, that place of refuge for Malcolm, as someone said, while Malcolm was out in the streets, Dr. Betty was home, but she wasn't just home uh, twiddling her thumbs. She was home making sure that an environment, a nurturing, protective, safe space was maintained where her husband could express the stresses that he's, he's going through, where he could be reaffirmed, where he could play with his daughters and, and, and block out everything, as he said in his own words, that was going on out there. And that, that's a tremendous sacrifice, and it takes a tremendous amount of work. And so the sacrifices that Dr. Betty made in that regard are extremely critical. And I think th this is something that the, uh, our, our sisters can't lose sight of. Because uh, it, we, we either will, as, an, as a community, in terms of our gender relations, we'll, we'll put ourselves in a, a space where it's a win-win situation, where both the men and women win, or we'll continue down the road, generally speaking, that we're going, and it will be a lose-lose situation. The, the sisters will lose because in, in a, 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 a very uh, dogged focus, and n not to, to delegitimize if this is someone's lot, but just to explain in, in a particular context. If there's a dogged focus on career, if there's uh, the prioritizing the career over being someone's wife, then we, if, 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 if and if, if brothers respond by not wanting to uh, make the sacrifices necessary on, on, on our end to complement uh, our wives, then it's a lose-lose because it's a lose-lose because who ultimately were the greatest beneficiaries of the, the family that was started by Hajj Malik Shahbaz, Malcolm X, and Betty Shahbaz, their children. And, and so if our children lose, we lose. Because we're gone soon enough. We're gone. They remain behind. And if we didn't put them in a position to carry the, the torch of family, carry the torch of complementariness as opposed to competition between the genders uh, and, and a complementariness that was beautifully described by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Nisa'u Shaqa'ikur Rijal Shaqa'ikur Rijal Women are the complementing halves of men and, and so if we're, if we're uh, in competition with each other and that competition becomes so un, un, unintentionally, unwittingly, so not to imply, oh, sisters, brothers, no, just for whatever reason, becomes so intense that the fact that we are designed emotionally, physically, spiritually to complement each other, that, that if that gets lost, it's a lose-lose situation. And so when you look at Dr. Betty Shahbaz and Hajj Malik Shahbaz, Malcolm X, you see two individuals complementing each other in an extremely beautiful, deep, and meaningful way. And I think that's what we can take from, from Dr. Betty's life. Uh, penultimately, uh, as I think the last speaker, I forget the gentleman's name, uh, was, was mentioning, they complemented each other in death. Projection. 
they were both martyrs. Their paths were different, but they were both martyrs. And so Allah chose both of them for shahada. Real martyrdom, not, not some pathological murderer blowing himself up in a marketplace and then calling that a martyrdom operation. That's, that's murder-suicide. Two major sins that both damn a person to hell. So they, 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 they were martyrs in the true sense of the word. They lost their lives under circumstances that Allah and the Messenger of Allah described as being martyrs and having a, a sure place in Jannah. So may, may Allah reward both of these martyrs and may Allah bless us to take, uh, take abundantly from their, their, their lives and the lessons that they teach us through uh, individually and through each other. Uh, finally, I mentioned penultimately prior to this, so finally, I'll say this. Uh, Alhamdulillah, you know, the, the African-American experience, I've heard some people lamenting uh, just the injustices, the oppression. And again, I think it's absolutely critical for us to understand that in an Islamic light. If we understand it in, in a dunya we light, especially in the light of uh, many of the social and political theories that are dominating our academies and have really taken over the minds of most people, we become bitter. We might become angry with Allah. Some people will apostate. Some people will continue to pray and fast, but they'll look for their social and political program uh, in places like the camp of Black Lives Matter. And so it's, it's critical for us to understand the suffering of our people, African American people, uh, in, in, in the context of Islam. And to me, the most important aspect of that, one of the most important aspects of that is the following. Uh, I mentioned two out of many, many hadith. If, if you want to just get a, a, a deeper and richer understanding, just read the, the chapter of patience in Imam Nawawi's uh, Riyadh al-Salihin. So amongst the hadith he mentions, إِذَا أَحَبُّ اللَّهُ قَوْمًا إِبْتَلَاهُمْ if Allah loves a people, He casts them into trials and tribulations. And so we have to understand that sometimes when we see suffering in the world, it's a sign of divine love. And that sounds strange to people because our, our, our thought processes, generally speaking, and not necessarily any Muslim, just the general zeitgeist, is one of, of, of rampant, rabid materialism. And in that sense, there's no akhirah. There's no hereafter. And so any worldly suffering is... is, is it's, it's, it's not comprehensible. Why is it happening like this? And that's it. But that's not it. Nothing afflicts a believer. Even the pricking of a thorn except that Allah expiates some of their sins. And so worldly suffering for a believer or people from uh, uh, Ahlul Fatra or people who haven't heard the message of Islam or in a comprehensible way it's a, it's, a, it's a means for eternal salvation and eternal bliss. And it's, it's, it's so insignificant that like any suffering that we experience in this world is so insignificant in the greater theme, scheme of things. If you take from the, the when Allah Ta'ala first initiated time and you... you Place that on a continuum that extends to eternity. So it's endless. What was 70, 60, 80, 
90 years in the world look like? It would be so insignificant. You couldn't even, you couldn't even locate it. it. You couldn't even, there's no known way to measure it. Even with atomic uh, measuring, you couldn't, you, couldn't, you couldn't measure it. It's so insignificant. And so that, the eternity, that's what we're living for. And so when, when Allah ex exposes us to suffering, we mentioned the hardship of Betty Shabazz, her, her upbringing, the, the hardship of what she's dealing with as, as Malcolm is getting deeper and more deeply involved in the struggle, uh, the hardship that she had to deal with in witnessing his murder in front of her eyes, and then sheltering her children from that and then trying to raise her children uh, with that trauma and the struggle to become a doctor, the laudable struggle. All of that was part of her ticket to paradise and ultimately uh, dying in, in, in the fire. All of that was part of her ticket to paradise. And now, so we're talking... Uh, Dr. Betty, 60 some odd years, we're talking eternity. And we should never lose sight of that. Otherwise, we'll think that this little bit of insignificant time that we, we spend in this world is, is everything. And because it's everything, if there's no justice here, there's no justice. If there's no mercy here, there's no mercy. Allah Ta'ala mentions, or the, the Prophet Sallallahu Allah has divided his mercy into 100 uh, segments. One segment is all the mercy that exists and will exist and has existed in this world. Not just for a human being, the mercy of creatures, the bird protecting her little uh, birdies in the nest. All of that mercy is one portion of Allah's mercy. The rest is reserved for Yom Al-Qiyamah when our account is taken. The other 99 are for Yom Al-Qiyamah. It tells us what? That's what's important. That's what really matters. And so, patiently enduring, persevering, not complaining, never once. We, Betty Shabazz, she had a quiet dignity, the dignity of a patient believer. She had a disposition that exuded patience. She had a disposition that exuded patience. And that, that, that's what we need to focus on. Because other things we can get elsewhere. This sort of, 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 of life that, that we're sometimes oriented to reflect on, we can get that elsewhere. But that, that, that quiet dignity, that perpetual motherhood, that, that and... and, and, and uh, spouse. You can't get that everywhere. You can't get that everywhere. And so may Allah bless uh, the organizers for causing us to reflect. As I said, anything I said is not to negate anything anyone else might have said, but is, you know, what I, what I want to do, because I'm, I'm old now, so when you get old, you get ornery and cranky and I, you know, I want to talk about things people don't normally talk about. Otherwise, it's boring. I mean, how, how many social justice speeches can you listen to? And, and they're all the same. Whether it's the Muslims, whether it's the socialists, rather it's the whoever, they're all the same. If you heard one, you've heard them all. And that's not to say we don't need to hear it. So don't, don't, when, when you start tweeting out and uh, everything, don't sit and say we don't need, we, we do need to hear it. But we also need to, need to hear those things that are rooted in our deen that we don't talk about very much these days. And so may Allah give us tawfiq, may Allah bless us uh, to be patient in our, in our pursuit of justice. Because you're always going to have injustice. You know, I'm, I'm sorry to, to disappoint anyone who has utopian fantasies. You're always going to have injustice. You know why? 
Because Allah Ta'ala is always going to love a whole lot of the believers. And, and, and Allah Ta'ala loves uh, to love the believers so much so if we don't uh, do those things that Allah loves, Allah says you bring another people. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu man yartadda minkum an deenih fasawfa yati allahu bi qawmin yuhibbuhum yuhibbuna O you believers, Allah is talking to us. If you turn back on this religion and not, it's not talking about apostasy, if you turn back from helping and assisting and working for this religion, Allah will bring another people. And what is their first attribute? Yuhibbuhum yuhibbuna. Whom he will love them and they will love him. He will love them and they will love him. So, because Allah loves believers, and because if, if there are those who aren't doing the things Allah loves, He will bring someone who will, because He loves the believers, there will always be suffering. There will always be injustice. Because if Allah loves the people, He tries them. How does He try them? With injustice, with oppression, with suffering. And if they patiently persevere and they continue to worship Allah and they don't despair of Allah and they don't cast Islam to the side uh, like, a, like, like a tool. Islam was my tool to liberation and I'm still unliberated. So the tool didn't work. So I'll discard it and try something else. This was the critique of the ulama of Azhar against Muhammad Abdu and Jamal al-Din al-Afghani. Their, their critique was they instrumentalized Islam as a tool to combat and overcome Western hegemony and colonization and the oppression of the Muslims. And they, they argued, and, and once you uh, make it into a tool, an instrument, if it doesn't serve its purpose, they'll discard it and just go with Pan-Arabism or some other tool that they deem to be more effective in accomplishing the goal. So Betty Shabazz showed that dignity in the face of tremendous trials. She showed that patience in the face of tremendous trials. And as we rightfully, justifiably honor her and salute her and, and highlight her as, uh, various aspects of her, of her life, this is one aspect we should never fail to highlight and we should never fail to mention. Because this is something that will sustain us and suffice us today, right now, in the face of the many, many, many challenges, deep, perplexing, complicated, complex challenges that we face as a community today in, in the Western world, there in the United Kingdom, here in the United States, in France, and elsewhere. May Allah give us tawfiq and taysir. May Allah ta'ala honor uh, Dr. Betty Shabazz. May Allah bless uh, myself to, to meet her in Jannah as I met her in this world and to honor me with the meeting in Jannah. May Allah bless me to meet all of you in this world before we start exiting. And uh, until then, uh, may you have a wonderful, wonderful balance of your day or night, whatever the case might be. We uh, thank the organizers for this opportunity to share a few thoughts. وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيبنا وقرة عيوننا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. عليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. جزاك الله خيرا إمام زيد شاكر آمين آمين آمين. To your beautiful du'as, for your insightful and beautiful reflections on Dr. Betty Shabazz and Malcolm X. You heard Imam Zaid Shakir, we are here to prepare for eternity. That is who we are as Muslims. And Dr. Betty, um, this is what she stood for. She stood for the deen. She stood for justice. She just stood for peace. She was the epitome of womanhood and motherhood. And she's left this amazing legacy for all of us to follow. Jazakallah khairan, uh, Imam Zaid Shakir, for honoring us this evening. Um, I'm actually very uh, moved. Jazakallah khairan. Um, brother Rakeem now will introduce our next speaker. Uh, which is our brother Khalil Ismail, brother Rakim. 
Assalamualaikum. Yes, alhamdulillah. Zakalake Imam Zaid. Alhamdulillah. A very moving talk. Alhamdulillah. It's a very it's a pleasure to be here to listen to it as well. Mashallah, and very insightful. And now we're going to move on to our dear brother, Khalil Ismail, a creative director and award-winning independent artist and producer. Khalil is also the founder and manager of KI Creative Studios, which recently launched its new film, Directing Components. A world-renowned musician and lyricist, Khalil Ismail has released six studio albums and is currently producing two additional albums. His music is enjoyed in more than 40 countries and has been licensed to major companies including Discovery Channel, PBS, NBA, CBS Sports, Fox Drama and Red Bull. Welcome to Brother Khalil. The mic is yours. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, I just want to make sure that I am... The, am I clear? Can you hear me? Just somebody can say you can hear me so I know I'm good. Yes, we can hear you, brother. Okay. All right. All the good How are here? Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone who's well, I've, I've been here the whole time and I've had an opportunity to listen to everyone um, speak uh, and have appreciated everyone's input so far. Um, I have some people who I know here, including you, my brother. It's been a while, brother Rankin, as well as. Sister Ashraf and Taslim and um, many of you I know, and I've had the pleasure of listening to many of the Man Zane's lectures. So, um, and I really appreciate the, the, the added balance to, to his perspective. So I'm going to give a give a perspective, um, hopefully that kind of feeds off of where he's coming from. Um, um, Bismillah. Uh, <clears throat> you know, when I think of uh, uh, the concept um, that, we're, you know, of, of honoring Betty Shabazz, I think of really the concept of uh, making sure that we honor those people that, as Imam Zay said, are you know also known as the complementary pieces or the pieces that we absolutely necessarily have to have in order for a lost cousin to be carried out. And you know they're just as important as any piece. You know, oftentimes we look at the person who is. Um, may, whose name, you know, we may say or mention as the most important, but it's actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who will decide, you know, um, he will decide in his time, you know, at judgment time and at the time, at this time, we don't know who they are, who will actually be highest um, in rank, you know, and we know that there will be many people who may have played or seem to have played the complementary role on the earth and yet they will be in, in the hereafter, they will be uh, highlighted even higher than some people who on the earth were named, you know, even uh, more and given more credit by us people here. Um, so making sure that we uh, acknowledge and that we uh, make sure that we, making sure that we acknowledge the role and acknowledge the importance of the role of being complimentary is just as important because the vast majority of us, matter of fact, every us, every one of us, we must, even if we are leaders, we must play a complimentary role in some way in our lives, whether we are husbands, whether we are wives, whether we are children, whether we are fathers, daughters. So, I think about the fact that I'm just going to go off of, you know, the sister Ashra, for, for, well, I want to thank you again for uh, in organizing this. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story and, and, and bring it into, tie it into this. You know, when I think about Betty Shabazz, I just think about the pattern of Allah. And Allah talks about the fact, in Quran, Allah says that his, Allah owns his own sunnah. And he says, he says the sunnah of Allah never changes. His patterns, the ways that he goes about creation never changes. And part of that pattern is that he creates righteousness and righteous people, and he creates evil around those righteous people. And there's more evil than the righteousness. And no matter when you look at the history of mankind throughout, when you look at us as a people from the beginning all the way to the end, the vast majority of the world is more evil than good. But the righteous, the light of the righteous people are, is so profound that they end up being the most important. 
So there's some people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates to interrupt the status quo of the world and raise their vo voices and give pro protest to injustice. And he really favors them when not only do they give protest to injustice, but they also choose Allah and choose to worship Allah. And that is the great balance. For Allah does ask the people who give protest to injustice and the people who are quiet. He asks them to worship him first. And whether you are in that fight or outside of that fight, you must observe sabr. You must observe balance. You must remember him much, right? But Allah chooses certain people to just be interrupters. And when I think about Betty's early life, you know, Betty, Betty Shabazz, you know, it, it is reported that, you know, early in her life that she, you know, had to separate from her biological mother, you know, due to abuse. And then when she was <clears throat> raised with, uh, uh, foster parents, she would raise questions about racism where which her parents would silence her, you know, hope, hoping that if, you know, the silence would continue, that racism would eventually go away or go away in her mind, right? But Allah had already created and chosen her, created inside of her a fire, a light inside of her, a curiosity inside of her, um, to question the status quo, to question the injustice, to question why is why are things the way they are? And if those people, the people who she was with, you know, the parents at the time weren't going to be able to answer those questions, it would be that a lost cousin would send her somewhere else. That somewhere else was where she went to study. Uh, and she went to study first in Alabama. And of course, she was jolted with a harsh kind of Southern racism. And a harsh reality, a harsh kind of uh, push into, rea into the reality of racism, interestingly enough, right? Someone who is questioning, who's kind of being sheltered. But because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created that in her, the first thing he does with her is he puts her in a position, in a situation to be tested even harder, right? And you would think that, you know, and, you know as kind of Imam Zayd alluded to, that a lot of us kind of think that when we assign ourselves as special people to fight injustice, that somehow we are supposed to get special results. But the reality is, is that when Allah chooses a person, Allah actually puts them through the harder test. When Allah chooses a person to actually learn something to give to the world, they actually go through harder tests. And that should be the expectation. Therefore, when you go into those places, you know, Allah gives us the example of people like our woman, our, our mother, our mother that Allah names in the Quran, and Allah calls her the best woman in the world, Mary. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses Mary. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses Mary because he, first, before, before Mary ever has Prophet Isa, Allah... Uh, tells us about the traits of Mary, that she is a great worshiper, that she is a patient one, that she is a chosen one, that she that her worship is so standout, right? That, you know, that he takes it upon himself, right? To actually give her sustenance. But before she transcends into that next step, he tries her, he tries her hard. He tries her with the test of having to deal with public, uh, with public humiliation. All to the point to the point where he tries it to the test of having to deal to deal with the birth, right? That makes her feel and think, you know, you know, why am I here? I wish I was never here. That type of trial. So again, you have a situation where you know Allah Subhanahu wa Taala creates someone, right, who is to be chosen. He chooses that person outside of the one who she compliments. And this, in her case, you know, in the in the sense of revelation, again, a lost pattern doesn't change. In a sense of revelation, you know, she is to birth someone who, who would end up being, right, the name that billions of people call to for a whole religion, right? But she is the one who actually plays the complementary role in that space. And she has to go through trial, you know. And if anyone thinks the trial of being blamed if for... Of a, of, of a chaste woman being blamed uh, for uh, being unchaste is an easy trial. 
then know that the Quran literally curses people who does who do that and do not repent. That trial has to be one of the hardest trials for the dignified woman, right? So let's go back now to Betty, who Allah is slowly, before she even ma marries Malcolm, when you think about it and you look at her life, he's creating an environment through struggle and through trial, right? Where she's learning and she's learning about herself, that she is not satisfied. She is not okay with being quiet with the injustice, right? But she's still trying to figure out how to deal with it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then brings her to the place where she is now uh, married to. She finds, you know, Allah brings them together, right? And when Allah brings them together at this point, you know, it is not, to me, when I look at her life, it is not this point at which Betty uh, finds that she is going to be a revolutionary. Betty has already had the revolutionary spirit in her since birth. And Allah, in his infinite and his beautiful mercy and wisdom and qadr, right, brings together two people who care about humanity. And so when they come together, right, um, and one of the beautiful things that I just heard about their relationship is that, you know, and I love the way that Imam Zayd put it, is that um, they care about each other enough to communicate to each other, right? So the whole time, you can tell just by the fact that he, that Malcolm is, you know, he wants to send a letter. He wants to talk about, he's sending letters to his wife. He wants to talk about his dealings, you know, to his wife because his wife understands. But his wife doesn't understand just because she, it's Malcolm. It's not just because she's smitten because it's Malcolm X and he's a high figure in the eyes of many people. No, she has already been raised. The light has already been put in her soul to actually be able to speak to that reality. So they speak together. And now I want to go to my next point. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in the woman a great, uh, a great ability to advise. When I look at the, um, the history of our great people, the one thing that I see over and over and over again, you know, and we see it the most with, with our beloved messenger, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is the importance of the woman advisor, right? The one who can, you know, when we're going through hard times and hard struggle, that she can kind of bring us back to a certain reality. What's going on? Bring us back to balance. Or, as Imam Zay said, to create a nurturing, safe environment, right? Because at the end of the day, a team has to play different roles, right? But that can only happen because both parties understand what the bigger mission is. Right. And in this case, I would say the bigger mission of both Malcolm and Betty was their dedication to hop to truth. Right. And they, and Allah put them through stages in that space. Right. Where they where Allah raises them in one place where they go to the nation and then Malcolm finds a higher truth and then he finds a higher truth. And she's right there and she's right along with them. And one of the things that really stood out to me also was at that press conference and the time right after Malcolm is dead. She is holding down the fort, right? And they ask her about what's going on. And she's talking immediately about the philosophies that she believes that he had, that she believes in, right? That should be carried on. Because for her and for Malcolm, when you really look at it, what was really similar about them was that their dedication to the mission, to the truth, to find the truth that would help their people was more important than even themselves, right? So what I would like people to take away, uh, if, if I would say anything when it comes to, you know, for people to take, to take away, uh, a takeaway for this particular talk that I would, I would have with you is this. One, right, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created every soul and inclined that soul to do what it's supposed to do on this earth, right? And inclined that soul to worship him, right? And... The truth is, is that when it is only we fight our purpose when we stop worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or when Allah brings to us hop, when he brings to us truth and we reject that truth for convenience for, or because we want to look good in front of people or because there's power that's put in front of us. And when I look at Malcolm and, and I look at Betty and I see them the same in this way, the one, the parallel that I've seen between two of them is this, 
that whenever a truth came to them, that it was about how I adjust to the mission. So when I'm married to Malcolm, I'm going to compliment his mission because he has some information and some knowledge and some ability to carry out leadership in a way that I know this is my best role. And then when he's gone, all right, my mission is still my mission because Allah created my soul to incline to this regardless of whether he's here or not, right? And that, that mission is, is a dedication to truth and to hop, right? And when you find, whether that be male or female, right, that person who is complimentary, that person who can be an advisor, that person who can bring you back to balance, that person who can bring you back a safe space who you can communicate to freely and truthfully, uh, when you find that, and if you have that, no matter whether that relationship be between a husband and a wife, whether that be between a friend, or even between your children, right? Cherish that, right? Because it is indeed a rare thing. So when I look at Betty, I look at someone who, whatever the case, whatever life handed her, she stayed dedicated to truth and right. And for that, she is an example for all men and women. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jazakallah khairan, Brother Khalil, for your insightful and very thoughtful reflections on Dr. Betty Shabazz. Jazakallah khairan. Thank you for everybody for joining us this evening. Um, you are listening to um, a dedication tribute um, remembering Dr. Betty, the late Dr. Betty Shabazz. We've gathered here tonight to honor her legacy and to remind us of the path that she chose, the path of truth, the path of strength, and ultimately preparing um, for eternity, um, which was the mission of her and her husband, uh, Malcolm X. It gives me great pleasure to introduce um, our next speaker, who was a dear friend of uh, Dr. Betty Shabazz uh, of more than 30 years. Uh, Dr. Aisha Aladawiya is the founder and chair of Women in Islam, an organization of Muslim women which focuses on human rights and social justice. Dr. Aisha organizes and participates in conferences and forums on Islam, gender equality, conflict resolution, and cross-cultural understanding, as well as peace building. Dr. Aisha also represents Muslim women's non-governmental organizations at the UN United National Forums and coordinates Islamic input for the preservation of black religious heritage documentation project for the Schoenberg Center in Research on Black Culture. Additionally, Dr. Aisha also serves on the boards of numerous organizations in relation to global uh, the global Islamic community. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Aisha. This is the first time uh, Dr. Aisha is on Clubhouse. We're so honored. Dr. Aisha, if you just um, unmute yourself. Uh, there we go. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Aisha. Can you hear us, Dr. Aisha? Dr. Aisha, can you hear us? So you've unmuted, but I can't hear you. Rakeem, can you hear Dr. Aisha? No, not at the moment. It's... Okay. Well, we'll just give uh, Dr. Aisha a few minutes. Okay, while we wait for... Um, Dr. Aisha, to come to the mic. I'm going to uh, play an interview um, of um, Atala Shabazz, who was the eldest daughter of Malcolm and Dr. Betty Shabazz. Uh, she was asked about what it was like to grow up um, and have parents um, such as um, Betty and uh, Malcolm. Oh, my mother was my world. Not only just simply because I thought so, but I watched my father love her. She was beautiful to him. Hence, to me, no one was more beautiful than my mother. That, that you know, chinky-eyed smile, beautiful brown face, the warmth that she exuded, humor, 
That to me was what was beautiful. My mother's dedication and love and commitment to my father, I think is what has sustained her over the last 27 years. I, as her daughter, wish for her an easier time. She gave up a lot, her youth. Having been in love and having been loved, I don't know if, a, if she's received flowers the same way, if she's gotten candy or the compliments the same way. And God forbid, if you know what love feels like, you wish you could have it forever. To our dearest mother, my father's brown sugar, his apple brown Betty, on behalf of your children, mother, on behalf of our children, thank you. You have represented for us, your daughters, undying strength, tenacity. You stand for the epitome of womanhood, mom, motherhood, and though it may not show a seed has been planted. And all that you gave to us on behalf of your undying love for our father, who is absent, though present spiritually, you have won. And that was the um, Atala Shabazz on the um, marriage of her parents, Malcolm and Dr. Betty Shabazz there. I'm um, just going to check if Dr. Aisha is with us. Dr. Aisha, can you hear us? Sometimes when um, somebody is new on Clubhouse, there is a, a glitch. Um, Dr. Aisha, perhaps um, you could just come out of the um, room and then come back in. Sometimes that works. I'm not sure why, but this is Clubhouse. We know this app is still in its um, um, beta stage. It's not even released yet, so these glitches do happen. Um, but you are honoured guests, so inshallah we're going to ma make this happen. So, Dr. Aisha, if you can hear me, perhaps if you um, um, just come back to the room just to to refresh, and then uh, we'll see if we can um, get you on, because I, c I can see that you've unmiked, but um, we cannot hear you. Brother Rakeen, if you would um, just um, reset the room, please, um, and tell everybody about Rumi's Cave and Viva the Strangers, and I'm going to just um, see if I can um, reach Dr. Aisha. Thank you. Okay, alhamdulillah, sure. So, salam alaikum, everybody. Alhamdulillah, thank you so much for being here today. Um, it's been a really inspiring event, uh, all of these great, speakers and performers who have taken part today have made it really uh, I think alhamdulillah uh, Dr. Betty would have been pleased with um, what has happened and I hope that inshallah every year we can do this to remember and it's important that we remember our heroes people in our time uh, who are doing great work who are inspiring others as uh, Dr. Betty Shabazz and her husband, Hajj Malik Al Shabazz, what they have done, you know, they in, they've inspired, they've inspired nations, and, I, and they are still inspiring, you know. And one of the things I reflect on when I um, think of Malcolm is that even today, um, lots of the words that he said uh, are sounding more and more real in our time. Like for example, when he uh, when he spoke about the media, and he said the media, he's very can worried about the media because the media can make an innocent person guilty and a guilty person innocent. This is something that I always reflect on. I think some like he said it so long ago, but it's it's even more and more pertinent now when we have the idea of the fake news everywhere. You know, so this is um, so true. Um, so this has been put on, this is a collaboration with the strangers. This is this group here and also Rumi's Cave. So, and uh, for those of you that are new, when you go to, um, if you look at the top of the screen where it says the strangers, 
It's got a greenhouse. You can click on that and join the group. And also you can do the same. If you go to um, Rumi's Cave, it's another house. You can do the same. You can join the group there for more of these kind of events. And also, you know, we can follow, follow all of the, the speakers and all the mods who have done a great job today. We are definitely hoping that we will hear from Aisha, uh, the, our, our mother, and someone who's so important because was the best friend of, of uh, Dr. Betty. So this is actually a, a real life um, woman that we have here, a role model and someone who actually knew Betty personally. So definitely we have to make this work, as Sister Ash was saying. Also, um, we, we spoke about uh, Rumi's Cave as well. But what I'm thinking actually is that while we're waiting, because this might take a little bit of time, uh, if there was any one person or anyone who wanted to say anything about how they felt about the event today, then uh, you could just say uh, you, you, you're welcome if you put your hand up we can be on the stage you can just say how you felt about the event today that would be uh, you're welcome to do that inshallah while we're waiting for um, our dear sister uh, Aisha to be able to get on the clubhouse as we know clubhouse is very new <laughs> so it has these you know these kind of hiccups you know so inshallah we're just uh, waiting inshallah uh, hopefully should be able to um, get this sorted out soon. Um, so like Okay, Bismillah. We have somebody who's going to come. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Zakia. Mashallah. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. I just wanted to thank you so much, um, you and Ash, for organizing this and bringing all these amazing speakers and poets and I've really been enjoying this today. Alhamdulillah. It's so Alhamdulillah. To preserve the memory and uh, correct understanding of who Dr. Betty Shabazz was. Jazakallah khair. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much. Zakia. Yes, Alhamdulillah. It's very important for us to do that as well, to preserve um, the memory of uh, the great Dr. Betty Shabazz. Thank you so much for... For your, for your kind words there. Alhamdulillah. So if there's anybody else who wanted to say something while we're waiting, uh, you're welcome as well, inshallah. You can raise your hand and bring you up. Okay, let's see. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, is that the um? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa taala wa barakatuh. Um, I just wanted to say that it's uh, been an honor, um, remembering. May Allah receive them in peace with khudhu fasih jannat ya Rabb. Thank you for organizing this event and um, thank you for reminding us of what we know and what we need to continue to know and need to remember. May we remember Allah in all of our doings. Jazakumullah khair. Ameen, ameen. Jazakumullah khair. Sifu Safa for your beautiful words and dua. Ameen. And salam alaikum, Naeem. Salam alaikum, Rakeen. Salam alaikum, everybody. Um, just so happy to be on and hearing and seeing a whole afternoon or evening dedicated like this. Reminds me of my days of great times that I spent with you guys at Rumi's Cave. In, MashaAllah. In, uh, <laughs> um, Good to see you on here. Alhamdulillah. I need to be done you on Clubhouse. MashaAllah. Okay, great, great, I, great. I, just because I'm one of the old folks, you know, I get on here <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> but beautiful program, beautiful program. All, all, the, all the speakers, people I know and just really just adore and are all of them are all in my du'as and you um, know, Waiting for Sister Aisha. I even follow her on Facebook and whatever. So um, thank you guys for doing this. And we need more of this. Don't stop. Keep it going. Inshallah. Amen. Amen. And for those of you that don't know who this brother is, this, this is my brother from Native Dean. 
MashaAllah, Native D, Alhamdulillah, is one of the, the first um, the, the Nasheed groups as well. We used to do a lot of events together around and tour together, MashaAllah. So he's part of the the, uh, the famous Nasheed group, Native D, Alhamdulillah, so it's good to have him here. But yes, we, we he's come to Rumi's game many times and we've, we've seen each other a lot in London, Alhamdulillah. So it's, it's a pleasure to, to have him here, Alhamdulillah. Last thing, Sheikh Babakar, Assalamualaikum, if he's on, it was so, I haven't talked to him since the last time I was in in London, so no, yeah, was that was a, such a treat, you met, uh, Sheikh, such a treat. <laughs> How are you and I, and I, and I, I catch your dramas too, so I'm going to stop because I'm turning it into like my family reunion, but uh, so great to hear from all of you. Uh, so good to hear from you too, my brother. It's absolutely a pleasure. How is, how is the family? All's well. All everyone's well, alhamdulillah. Please keep us in your dua. May Allah bless you and all your brothers in native deen. Please give salam to them, inshallah. I will do, inshallah. Assalamualaikum. Shukran. And if my brother, Imam Zaid, Zaya, please, assalamu alaikum, Sheikh Zaid. May Allah bless you. You are always a wise man saying wise words. May Allah keep you and give you tawfir, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Um, thank you, uh, Brother Rakeen. And um, it was really nice to see you, Brother Naeem. Mashallah, I've not seen you for about seven years myself. I think the last time we saw you was maybe 2013 at the um, GP for uh, Islam Channel. Uh, it's an honor to uh, see you here. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So we're going to try uh, my auntie, Dr. Aisha. Can you hear me? If you um, unmute yourself just at the bottom, um, if you press your mic. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Aisha. Dr. Aisha, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Uh, Rakeen, is it just me or? Um, no, yes, uh, we can't hear. We can't hear, we Dr. Can't Aisha. hear Dr. Aisha. Yes. Um, Dr. Aisha. Oh. alaikum. We just heard you. Okay. Assalamu alaikum again. Wa alhamdulillah. Wa alaikum Sorry for the um, uh, um, uh, ineptitude uh, uh, on uh, these platforms these days, but um, I did. Uh, I had the opportunity to listen to everyone speak, uh, honoring Dr. Shabazz. Uh, and uh, it was uh, really heartwarming uh, to see these kinds of conversations emerging uh, around Dr. Shabazz because often uh, we are focused on her husband, uh, who is the mentor to all of us, uh, but she also uh, has a place in her own right. So I'm happy uh, to uh, be with you and to hear these wonderful talks and stories uh, honoring Dr. Shabazz. Thank you, Dr. Aisha. The, the pleasure um, is ours. The honor is ours. Um, I said in, in your introduction that you were a very close friend of Dr. Betty Shabazz and you were with her also during her final moments before she returned to Allah. Um, please take us back to the first time you met Dr. Betty Shabazz. What do you recall about your first meeting and what were your uh, thoughts um, on Dr. Betty Shabazz uh, prior the first time you met? Well, um, <laughs> so that is a long story. Um, I met uh, Dr. Shabazz in the early 70s uh, at the time when I was a new Muslim. And uh, we all uh, were uh, uh, members of the Islamic Cultural Center uh, in New York City. Uh, and at the time, uh, the Islamic Cultural Center was uh, a brownstone uh, in uh, Manhattan, uh, on 72nd Street and Riverside Drive. Uh, so I always refer to this place uh, at the time as a mini UN uh, because it was the environment where we as Muslims, old and new, uh, got to meet Muslims from all over the world. This was a place where we all congregate, congregated. And indeed, this is the place where I first met uh, Dr. Shabazz. So um, uh, it was a time when uh, we were new uh, in uh, Islam and we were really eager and passionate 
about learning uh, our religion because we were very serious and focused on being a practiced Muslims. So we had classes that we attended regularly. Um, and uh, part of the culture of that gathering was uh, in intermissions between the various Islamic classes that we would have, uh, we would retire to another floor of this brownstone uh, for a kind of social gathering uh, to get to know each other, to have some refreshments uh, and to introduce ourselves. So one of the things that we did was when when a new Muslim came into the room, uh, the first thing that uh, would be asked was, "Is um, well, what brought you to Islam? <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, that's the question that I got uh, when I entered this space at the time. So um, uh, having a, a history, somewhat of a history, uh, certainly a passion um, about uh, Hajj Malik Shabazz and his teachings. Uh, and, you know, this gentleman continues to be my mentor uh, to this day. Uh, so the thing that came out of my mouth, and I still say I don't know why I said what I said, uh, but I said what I said. <laughs> so when they asked me, well, what brought you to Islam? I said, uh, well, I'm just following Malcolm, <laughs> you know. Uh, and so uh, the person, a, a woman that I knew, uh, was sitting next to Dr. Shabazz. So she pointed to Dr. Shabazz and said to me, well, meet Mrs. Malcolm X. And, uh, you know, I, I was like, you know, like in the presence of royalty. You know? uh, so Dr. Shabazz, which was uh, kind of her uh, habit of uh, putting her hand over her heart and bowing very gently and gracious, graciously. And she said, "Salam alaikum. And that was the beginning, you know, of our relationship that lasted until um, she uh, returned to Allah. Uh, and what I want to share very briefly with you, because I think that um, everyone has had uh, much to say about uh, Dr. Shabazz and how she uh, impacted their lives um, and how they, we don't, we're all learning to get to know her better. Uh, and, and of course, we love uh, Hajj Malik Shabazz. Uh, but um, uh, Dr. Shabazz was uh, this person who was a very private uh, Muslim. Uh, and uh, she uh, didn't talk uh, or, or perform her uh, religion uh, in a public way. Uh, but I would get those calls uh, if she was traveling all over the world and coming back into New York or Harlem uh, or even wherever she was, she would sometimes make these calls two, three o'clock in the morning uh, just to talk, right? And what she wanted to talk about was the fact that uh, she was a Muslim woman and I was a Muslim woman. And this was a part of her life that was very private, uh, but she also knew that she can have that conversation with me. Uh, so that's what we did. And it was our relationship uh, throughout. Um, um, uh, I mean, we know her as this mighty, towering uh, individual. Uh, but we also uh, are learning about her as this person who had this enormous heart. I mean, she was soft-hearted. And one of the stories that I'd like to share about Dr. Shabazz, um, um, you know, j just to kind of um, speak about uh, her compassion and her love and her soft-heartedness, you know, e e even, you know, um, as we speak about this towering woman and all of the accomplishments that she had, uh, and the impact, you know, that she left uh, behind for us. Um, you know, Dr. Shabazz was left after her, her husband was martyred uh, to raise uh, their daughters. And uh, Dr. Shabazz uh, saw in Haja 
um, uh, our mother, Hajar, in how she was left uh, in the desert alone with her child um, and how she depended solely on Allah for sustenance and guidance. And this was a very personal experience for Dr. Shabazz, and it was one that was so close to her that often at the mention of uh, Hajar's name, uh, she would be really brought to tears. So uh, one uh, example of that is uh, when I made Hajj, uh, my husband and I, we, uh, we, 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 after making Hajj, we, after we made Hajj, I'm sorry, all of the technology is going off at the same time. Um, we brought um, a gift back from Hajj for Dr. Shabazz. And that was a replica of the Kaaba. Uh, my husband uh, uh, brought uh, bought one for me and we bought one for Dr. Shabazz. And one of the rituals that Dr. Shabazz and I had was whenever she traveled and came back through Harlem, uh, she would park outside in her car and we would just sit and talk for hours. Uh, but often uh, we would uh, take her to this restaurant, the Afghan restaurant, that she loved very much. Uh, she liked the food very much. And uh, I think part of the attraction was that the owner, was a Muslim woman from uh, Afghanistan as well, and who, who, who really doted on her and uh, treated her like uh, the queen that she was. So she loved to go to this place. And uh, so we took her there for, for dinner. And uh, this was the time when we wanted to present her with the gift that we brought back for her from Hajj. Uh, so uh, during dinner, well, we would began to open up the gifts that we brought uh, to her, and um, uh, there was a beautiful scarf, you know, that I uh, bought for her, and of course uh, this uh, beautiful necklace that I that I still wear to this day. Um, and when uh, we gave her this uh, necklace and started to talk about the experience of Hajj, you know, and, you know, these, these are stories that we are just beginning to uncover about uh, the legacy of our mothers uh, and how we need um, uh, fresh research and new scholarship uh, to unearth those stories that have yet not been told about uh, the women uh, who have sustained us through the centuries. And, and, and going forward. So, you know, at the mention of Hajj, uh, Dr. Shabazz is immediately uh, brought to tears. Uh, and this is to say how connected she felt to that experience and, and her own experience losing her husband uh, while she was carrying still two other children, twins, and the other daughters that she had. So uh, these, are, these are stories and feelings and emotions that Dr. Shabazz uh, shared, uh, you know, very differently than she did out in public, you know, with her academic friends and other high-profile relationships. Uh, as I said, she was a very private woman, and these were things that she would share with me. Uh, as her sister, uh, we had, um, uh, uh, um, uh, I used to keep uh, copies of the autobiography of Malcolm X and I would I would organize a lot of programs around uh, Hajj Malik Shabazz, and at one of these programs, uh, we were giving out uh, the paperback copies of uh, the autobiography. So we're asking Dr. Shabazz to autograph those copies, and in the copy that she autographed for me was, um, she said, a throwback to my childhood. <laughs> So uh, I treasure, you know, I treasure that. Um, but I want to say that um, the woman that we know, you know, as this highly accomplished woman, uh, you know, who traveled the world, uh, who had all kinds of, uh, of access 
to different uh, people at different levels in society. She was a woman. She was a woman and she was a Muslim woman. And this was the part of her that was so deeply embedded in her that she only chose it, chose to share it with very few people. And I'm blessed and honored uh, that she chose me to be one of those people to, to share that with. Uh, and in that was a lot of uh, fight and struggle uh, uh, to be Muslim. Because uh, as uh, Imam uh, Zaid uh, said, that uh, Dr. Shabazz uh, told him, uh, by the way, that was a program that I had uh, organized uh, uh, about Hajj Malik Shabazz. I think, I don't remember the title of it, what, what it was. Uh, but uh, in any case, um, uh, uh, everyone claims Muslim, uh, claims uh, Malcolm, and everyone has a right to claim him because he was uh, this human rights activist and, and advocate uh, and really freedom fighter. So I think everyone has a right uh, to claim him. Uh, Muslims also have a right uh, to claim him. Uh, and what I think that we're just beginning to see is Muslim scholarship come forward and talk about uh, Malcolm in the context of being a Muslim and a freedom fighter, and that there was no contradiction in that. So I always welcome uh, those conversations. But Dr. Shabazz was also a freedom fighter, you know. I mean, she, she, she was uh, the consummate mother and protector uh, up until the very end. Uh, but she was also the mother and protector of uh, people who were not biologically hers. Uh, she cared, you know, about women who were uh, destitute, uh, who were victimized uh, by intimate uh, violence in, and um, uh, unwed mothers. Uh, these were all the things that she cared about. And she supported uh, them very quietly. Uh, you know, there was no ceremony. There was no camera. Uh, but she did those kinds of things. And those people who benefit from that uh, know who they are. Uh, and I'm certainly one of those. Uh, so, I mean, uh, there is a lot uh, to talk about in terms of Dr. Shabazz. Uh, and I, I notice that whenever we talk about Dr. Shabazz, we always uh, talk about uh, Haj Malik Shabazz. Uh, and I think she would be fine with that because this was someone that uh, she loved dearly. And when you hear her talk, she tells you herself about the impact that he had on her. So I, I, I encourage us uh, to dig deeper into the struggles uh, that women like Dr. Shabazz um, uh, had and still have. Uh, you know, uh, being married to a man like Malcolm X, uh, you don't get the same reception that other women who are married uh, to uh, leaders in our communities who are more readily welcomed into the society. Uh, this was not uh, Dr. Shabazz's case. Uh, so uh, there was always a struggle uh, uh, to uh, stand with dignity, uh, to stand as a Muslim woman. Uh, and she was also very ecumenical. I mean, she went everywhere uh, to the extent that um, one of the things that I felt compelled to do after she passed uh, was to create... Um, uh, the Dr. Shabazz uh, Awards Ceremony. And the intent behind that was that uh, many people didn't know that Dr. Shabazz was Muslim uh, because she functioned in the world as a human being, you know. Uh, uh, and and uh, she did not wear Islam on her sleeve, as it were, right? But she was also the woman who walked with the, uh, what we called uh, the, what was it, the, uh, the walkie, I forget what that thing is called, but you know, we had those uh, little boxes that we could play recordings on, the cassette tape, a cassette, cassette recorder, that's what it is. I'm dating myself now, yeah, right, I know. But um, she enjoyed listening to uh, the recitation of Quran. Uh, so she would walk with that walkman and, and listen to Quran to feed her soul and her spirit as she went out into the world and, quite frankly, did battle 
to uphold her husband's legacy and also the dignity, her own self-dignity, and to advocate, you know, for the liberation of uh, people who were oppressed, uh, starting with African Americans. So she amplified a lot of what her husband said. Uh, but in her own right, she struggled. Uh, so against all odds, you know, to be who she was. So the private Dr. Shabazz as the Muslim woman is something that I like to talk about because the world knows uh, those other stories about her as a strong woman out in the world, strong black woman, you know, doing what she does in the world. But they know very little about Dr. Shabazz as this Muslim woman. And so I think that's something that we need to uh, speak about, you know, and amplify when we talk about Dr. Shabazz and also lay down legacies for other young Muslim women to follow that as practiced viable Muslim women, we are called into the world to work for justice, you know, we, we, and that, that includes starting with our own children, our own families. Uh, I mean, those are not mutually exclusive domains. So we need to understand that we are not all called to do the same work, right? Uh, we need doctors, lawyers, um, everyone, and many of those in those categories are also Muslims, and they are women, you see. But they are, we have different callings and, callings and different paths, so uh, we need to understand that, and especially at this time when we are challenged on, on so many fronts about things that are impacting us. Uh, you all know that what's happening in the United States as um, uh, young black men and women are being hunted down and uh, actually uh, killed, you know, just for being uh, black men and women, you know, often uh, is something that we're dealing with. And the, these are challenges that we have to deal with. Uh, and I'm sure all of you on this uh, clubhouse are aware of what's happening in the world. So it's not uh, confined to the continental U.S., but it's, it's global. And these are things, again, that Muslim women are called to the forefront uh, to address because these are our children, you know, uh, and we have to speak about justice. I'm reminded of uh, the ayah that, that calls us to speak up for justice, uh, even if it's against ourselves. So in order to do that, we have to have a spiritual grounding. We have to have uh, foundational um, uh, wisdom and strength to stand on so that when we do show up in the world as viable Muslim women, right, we are prepared uh, to do what it is that we are called to do. And we must uh, show up in the world because, again, we are the ones who are having children and raising the nation. So our voices must be heard, right? And we must prepare ourselves uh, spiritually to be able to confront uh, the challenges that we uh, are facing. And there are many. But inshallah, Allah gives us the wherewithal uh, to do the things that we are called to do. Uh, but I want us to bear in mind that, yes, um, we, we are accomplished in so many areas, and especially in the West, uh, where you have access uh, almost to everything imaginable. Uh, but we also have to, uh, you know, uh, the the word Sankofa has been coming up for me a lot over the past weeks. Uh, Sankofa, go back and get it. Uh, you know, in these environments, when we've had access uh, to everything uh, imaginable, um, as Muslims often, um, we have left Islam behind. And we, be, we, 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 we rely on our academic uh, achievements and our prowess, you know, in the public square as, you know, uh, public intellectuals and so forth. Uh, but uh, often what's missing is the ability uh, or the willingness uh, to couple that with our grounding, uh, public grounding as viable Muslims in, in, in these spaces. So I'm, I'm calling on us to do that. Uh, but I want you to know that uh, 
Dak Shabazz was this towering figure. She remains uh, someone very close and dear uh, to me and to my heart. Um, I want to remind us also uh, that as we love uh, Haj Malik Shabazz and Dak Shabazz, that we must also love their children uh, and their grandchildren. Uh, and so we should not uh, forget that and show up in spaces uh, where we can uh, to support them. And not because of uh, being next to people who are famous or high profile, but because we are re really living out uh, in, a tr in the truest sense of the words, our love for uh, Malcolm X and Dr. Betty, uh, Dr. Betty Shabazz. So uh, these are things that I ask us to do. And uh, there is one uh, grandson that we still have with us. Uh, and I asked us to pray for him and to pray for all of uh, Haj Malik and Dr. Shabazz's ch children, uh, because we cannot say that we love uh, these people and not care, you know, for their families, uh, as we have to love and care for all of our children and all of our families. So I ask you to make dua for, for, for us all. Uh, and I ask us at the same time to show up in these spaces to continue to struggle, uh, literally fight for what is right. And yes, I heard Imam Zaid Shay, uh, Imam Zaid Shaker say, uh, you know, about all of the challenges that we face, uh, and we must face them, you know, uh, uh, but we must face them as strong Muslims. Uh, and there are many ways uh, to face them, as I said. Uh, there's not one road uh, that, you know, that we have to take, but all roads should lead us back to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we are called to the forefront now. And I must say that women, uh, generally, and Muslim women in particular, a call to the forefront now. And we must, one brother said to me that uh, Muslim women in many cases have to hold up the flag until the men get there. And, the, and, and that's our job as well. Uh, and that's in the context of uh, being supportive uh, in every way that we can uh, in our families. And at the same time, um, uh, we have to be trailblazers. We do. Uh, we have to. Uh, our daughters, our granddaughters, our great granddaughters and sons are, are watching us and they are wanting to know what is it that we are doing, uh, to make the world a better place. And I think that we have a responsibility to them, uh, to work towards that end. And may Allah give us the strength, the power, the insight, the wisdom, the vision. Uh, to do what it is that we are called to do. But you should know now that as young Muslims, it is time now, it's your time. And though it, the, the struggle is steep, it's uphill for sure. But, uh, it's like any other muscle. When you exercise that spiritual muscle, you grow stronger as you confront the status quo, which you must do, uh, to speak about justice. Um, as we bring along with us compassion and love, you know, for humanity. This is not just for Muslims, but it's for uh, humanity. So inshallah, I'm very happy to see young people on this um, what, uh, clubhouse. Yes, yes. And um, uh, I don't have much more to say. Uh, I think you've uh, said everything that I would want to say. Uh, there's much more to be said. Uh, but... Um, uh, this is just an initial uh, talk uh, about uh, the contributions, uh, challenges, and joy that Muslim women uh, bring uh, to our struggle and to our life and our liberation, inshallah. So may Allah thank you, the organizers, for this gathering. Thank you for including me in this conversation. And um, go back home in peace and love, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam, Dr. Aisha Aladawi. Jazakallah khairan um, for your moving uh, reflection there. Uh, one of the greatest pleasures I've had in organizing this event was meeting beautiful souls like yourself. And uh, like I told you from the first time we spoke, I asked you to adopt me straight away. 
and um, and I'm, I'm so honoured and proud to uh, call you my auntie. Thank you so much for your beautiful reflections on our dear uh, Betty Shabazz. One honour uh, it's been tonight to talk about her life, her legacy, and what she means to each and every one of us. Thank you so oh. much, dear. Really, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aisha. It's an absolute honour um, to say that we've been joined by a very special guest um, in the audience. Um, and um, sister, I've, I've, I've pinged you. Um, so inshallah, if you'll grace us uh, with your presence, we'd be so honoured. Uh, if you've come here to listen, then thank you so much. The honour is, is, uh, is ours. And uh, I'm just going to respect that you're, you're here and this is um, the space that we're holding for you and... Um, your family and please know um how much your father your mother and all of you mean to us tonight has really been uh moving dr aisha yes i'm still here oh, alham alhamdulillah um we, there's a special guest in, in the audience um uh, alhamdulillah so um so who is that special guest as i've got sister Ilyasa uh, shabazz oh that's audience. beautiful <laughs> Um, alaikum, Ilyasa. I'm so happy you joined us. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. I'm actually driving, so I. Uh, oh, I see that picture there. Okay. I'm actually I driving. That. Yeah. But this has been really wonderful. I, I know that I'm, my, I'm, I might be a little too noisy. Can you hear me? Yes, so we can hear you. Alhamdulillah, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Salam alaikum. Thank you so yeah. much. It's really beautiful. I'm, I'm sorry that I didn't get to hear more of it, but I know that I'm a little noisy. No, you're not noisy. No, you're, you're fine. You're noisy. You're perfect. <laughs> oh, okay. Good. Sister Elias, we've gathered here tonight to um, pay our respects and um, honor uh, your late mother, Dr. Betty Shabazz. We'll be calling her Mama um, uh, Betty all night honestly it's really moving to have you here with us um please if you'd like to share some reflections um many of us here have read your book um growing up x um and also betty before x uh which is why you know we're, we're here this evening and everybody shared their thoughts and reflections if you could kindly give us some words we'd be so honored uh, dr ash if you'd like to uh, speak with us So oh, where's the car? Inside? Dr. Um, Sister Elias, so the, the mic is yours. Um, you know, I really, you know, it's, it's not... Talking about my mother um, while I'm driving, ooh, that's a, that's, that's a difficult one. You know, what can I say? She w was... You know, I, I feel so honored to have had her tutelage all of my life. She was, um, you know, extremely compassionate, very loving, very wise, very giving and sharing. Um, you know, she inspired me to do the work that I do effortlessly because she gave, you know, so effortlessly. I'm, I'm, I, um, you know, one thing that she often said, you know, that always rings in my head is Ilyasa, just as one must drink water, one must give back and, you know, in the interim, find the good and praise it. And so her inspiration is, is simply that in spite of all of the challenges that confronted her as a young woman, um, the wife of a man who challenged a government that was historically unjust is, you know, she said he gave her her strength, her self-respect, uh, you know, reinforced her faith. She was al already a woman of significant faith when she married her husband. But what what stands out for me most of all is that she never accepted no or I can't as an answer for herself. She saw her, her home was firebombed with her in it. Um, she witnessed her husband's assassination 
She had four babies. She was pregnant with twins. And, you know, in spite of all of those challenges, she was still loving, still kind. Um, and I'm, I'm just grateful that I had her as a role model and, and as a teacher um, and someone who continually, who continues to inspire me. And, you know, Sister Aisha, I've always been extremely grateful uh, to her because, you know, when my mother was um, transitioning, Sister Aisha would always bring uh, Quranic recitations for her. And, you know, it was difficult to see my mother the way she was, but, you know, Sister Aisha just would bring it and, and play, you know, this really wonderful, um, you know, Quranic recitation and, and, and stay with my mother for as long as she could. And so I'm always grateful to her. She's just a beautiful, beautiful um, human being, woman, um, sister, and, you know, and, and that's what I have to say. And so I'm grateful that you all are holding her up um, because I do think that she's a tremendous inspiration to so many, to women, to men, to parents, you know, to, to children, that she's a wonderful inspiration. And I'm really grateful to you. So thank you very, very much. That is Ilyasha. Amazing. Ilyasha. Yes, Sister Aisha. I love you so much, dear, and I'm so happy that you uh, were able to join uh, briefly. Um, yes, yes, I love you. I love you more, and, and thank you, Yanis, for sending me the link really fast. Yanis, you are very welcome, you. Sister Yasa. You are very welcome. Yeah. It's, it's always a pleasure to hear you. May yeah. Allah bless you. Thank you, and same to you. As-salamu alaykum. Wa alaikum wa salam wa ta'ala kato. And Jazakalaka, Sister Elias, for, for coming and blessing us and coming on, on the stage. And uh, it's an absolute honor to have you here with us today, mashallah. Um, but both of your parents, uh, inspiration um, to us around the world. So, and, and that is the important thing to say as well that they're loved around the world, not only in America, but all through the Western Hemisphere and also for our Africa as well, their inspiration for us all. So alhamdulillah, Allah bless you and all of the family. And so now um, we're going to call um, on Rakaya, who's been doing uh, Poetic Minutes. So she's been sort of listening to the whole event and writing a poem uh, based on this event. So um, Rakaya, I'm over to you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much, um, all of the speakers, for such an incredible event. Um, it's been wonderful to hear about Dr. Betty Shabazz and to learn a lot more for myself as well. Um, okay, Bismillah, I'm going to start from the beginning and share. Some people are chosen to interrupt the status quo to question, to fight, born with curious minds and a light inside. The patterns of Allah repeat again and again. Righteousness surrounded by darkness and lack. The good are tested before Allah brings them back. Dr. Bahia Betty Shabazz, truly a remarkable woman who gave unconditional love and walked a chosen path ascribed by the Most High. A partnership made, one sheltered upbringing met turbulent past, equal opposite, complementing half. Just as blessed Khadija and Sayyidina Muhammad, peace be upon him, were chosen for each other, a marriage of souls in the heavens first. The patterns of Allah repeat again and again. Pillar, warm, tenacious, Mama Betty, kept in step, even when some found Malcolm's evolution hard to follow. She was a mirror and a refuge, always on his mind and in his letters. Perpetual wife, never lived as a widow, but held to the same energy, same love, same steadfast mission. Just as one must drink water, one must give back. She had a dedication to truth and care for humanity. The passing of her love could not obscure that clarity. She did not retire at 28 
for a private, quiet life that kept fighting, kept learning, kept embodying the hadith, seek knowledge even to China, even through distance, even through difficulty, seek, seek and give. She would be close to tears on hearing the story of Hajar, alone with her child in the desert, searching for water, and she alone with her children in the city, caring for six daughters. The patterns of Allah repeat again and again. But all her struggle paid forward to her ticket to paradise, the hardship of witnessing her husband's murder, raising her children through trauma, becoming a doctor and person to turn to, Allah tests those that he loves, and she had all the dignity of a patient believer. How can we claim these great legacies from a unique standpoint? Not like the nationalists, pan-Africanists, socialists and Marxists when they're claiming Malcolm, but how do we claim a legacy from another dimension of Islam, Iman and Ihsan? Dr. Betty left this realm at 63, a prophet's age. The patterns of Allah repeat again and again. She and her husband had a martyr's death in the true sense of the word. May they reunite in Jannah. May we take abundantly from their lives individually and through each other. May their children be blessed, all the family left. May our ummah strengthen together. Dr. Betty would say assalamu alaikum with a hand on her heart, bowing gently, Quran on her Walkman as she faced out to the dark. A freedom fighter and Muslim with no contradiction, fortified by her spiritual grounding leaving a legacy that is truly astounding. Thank you. Jasakhla Khair and Rukhaya. That was absolutely stunning. Jasakhla Khair. Rukhaya has been here from the beginning. She has been listening to all our wonderful and honoured speakers. And she's taken inspiration from everything they've said, they've said this evening and put it in a poem all in under a few hours mashallah jazakallah khair and rukhaya and you are um our future and the youth it's been such a moving um such a moving uh evening jazakallah khair and for joining us um as we remember dr betty shabazz tonight uh before imam zaid shakir closes us off um in a dua i'd like to thank every, the audience firstly for being here for taking their time um, all these a uh, couple of hours we've been remembering Dr. Shabazz. I'd like to thank our wonderful and honoured speakers for their time and wonderful reflections and for their insights and inspiration and for calling us all to look deep and remember why we are here and remember why we hold uh, Dr. Betty and uh, Malcolm as our heroes. And in close, I'd like to share uh, a few words um, that Dr. Betty Shabazz asked when she was uh, reflected in her life in a collection um, of essays. And Dr. Betty Shabazz said um, about uh, Malcolm and the leading into her family, our life together was short, but abandoned, but were abundant with experiences more rich than most people enjoy in a lifetime. Thinking of this has been some kind of consolation to me Although I have sincerely tried, I question whether I will completely adjust to the fact that he, Malcolm X, will never return. Whatever Malcolm X did and wherever he went, he always knew that I loved him. And whatever he said, I would do, not blindly, because over the years he had proven he had our best interests at heart. Malcolm was the greatest thing in my life. He taught me what every woman ought to learn, to live, to love, and to be true to myself and my responsibilities, and to use my spiritual, material, and intellectual capabilities to build a better human society. And that was uh, Dr. Betty Shabazz. I'd like to thank again um, our honoured speakers, uh, Sister Taslim uh, Jamil, Brother Rakeen Nais, Imam Zaid Shakir, uh, Brother Khalil Ismail Rukeya, Atuga, Dr. Aisha Aladawiya, uh, Brother Anis, who's joined us all the way from France, Sheikh Ahmed Babika, from Rumi's Cave and from London, and our dearest sister, Ilyasa Shabazz. Imam Zichakir, if you're still with us, um, if you'd close us off with a dua and um, 
And may Allah gather us all in a gathering better than this and to gather us all in Jalat al Firdos with um, Malcolm and Betty. Uh, Imam Sayyid Shakir, if you would please close us out. Perhaps our dear Imam has just uh, stepped out. Um, Sheikh Babika. Jazakumullah, uh, my sister. I was waiting for Sheikh Zai so I can say salam to him. I haven't met him for a long time. May Allah bless him. He's a wise, good man. May Allah give him tawfiq and success. Uh, to everybody, um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you for what you have done. For indeed, as I said in my reflection, uh, reminders are always good. And remembering our deceased is a sunnah in Islam so that we can learn from that uh, legacy they leave behind so that we can become the better people that Allah wants us to be. Please let us pray for her and for Malcolm X. These are really beautiful people. After Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there is no prophet. But people like Malcolm X, they are the people who represented the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the right way, where they stood tall, they were making people listen to them, and whatever they said, it entered into the heart of people who were seeking the truth. So may Allah allow us to have that. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-mursaleen. Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi ajma'in. O oh Allah, most merciful, most generous, most kind. I seek refuge in you and I ask you by your greatest names. Al-Hayya al-Qayyum ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. O oh Allah, we have gathered to remember one of your servants that has long left this world and returned to you. Her and her husband, they became a meaning for many people in living their life, navigating in this tough, difficult world, full of tests and trials, reaching out for you. Many of us find it difficult not to be able to navigate in the way that you have ordained for us. Forgive our sins and our shortcomings. Erase all our ill deeds and exchange all our bad deeds to good deeds and multiply them many times over and allow us to be among those whom you love. Look at us with your eye of mercy and shower us with your love and allow us to be among those who will show mercy so that in return you will show us mercy. O oh Allah, our Prophet, peace be upon him, has long left us, but he was yearning for his brothers and our sister always used to talk about brotherhoods Allow us to be among the brothers of Rasulullah Sallam, to dwell in heaven with him in the highest loftiest place in Jannah, to drink from his blessed right hand from al kawthar a drink that we will never be thirsty there after Ya Kareem. O Allah, we ask you for Al-Hajj, Shabazz and his wife. O Allah, raise them to the highest loftiest place in Jannah. Allow them to enter the entrance of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallam. Allow them to drink from the fountain al kawthar and allow them to always be in his company, Ya Kareem. If we reach the position they have reached, allow us to exit this world with your honor and with your blessing and with your mercy among those whom you will call the righteous, Ya Rabbil Alameen. For all those people who have listened and all those people who will listen later on, may Allah bless them and guard them and strengthen them and give them the tawfiq. For my sister Aisha, I hear her the first time as somebody who accompanied her May Allah give her long life with obedience and allow her success in this world and hereafter. And for all the daughters of this beautiful family, may Allah keep them well, unite them, and allow them to carry the legacy. And may Allah allow us all to be among those whom he will look at with his eye of mercy and always grace us with love and mercy. Ya Kareem. As salatu was salamu alayka ya Sayyidi ya Rasulullah. As salatu was salamu alayka ya Sayyidi ya Nabi Allah. الصلاة والسلام عليك يا سيدي يا حبيب الله الصلاة والسلام عليك يا إمام المرسلين الصلاة والسلام عليك يا خاتم النبيين الصلاة والسلام عليك يا شفيع المذنبين ألف صلاة وألف سلام عليك وعلى آل بيتك أجمعين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد 
وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين نعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين جزاكم الله خير والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته جزاكم الله خير Well, I think um, may Allah God rest on it. I think better than the one we have this evening. Wa Everybody taking part today. All of the sheikhs, all of the scholars, all of the poets. Allah bless everybody. And may Allah take everybody home safely. Inshallah. And may Allah help us to keep doing this every year to remember um, these beautiful role models that we have in our society. I mean, assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khairan.